The following is a special presentation of ABC Sports. There were three million paving blocks in 1911. Today, only a yard of brick remains. The two and a half mile path is surrounded by steel and concrete, silent centuries to the history made here. It is a legacy of speed. Between these walls, the risks are great. Emotions come from both ends of the spectrum. The Indianapolis 500 mile race is quite simply a spectacle, a celebration of technology and humanity. Today, it celebrates the diamond anniversary running. It was no different when the track was first planned. The first 500 was the spectacle of its day. The giant track beckoned the best of the age, and 80,000 fans, many arriving by horse and buggy. Ray Haroon won the first challenge. Since then, the lineage has raced on. Men who share a special look, the brotherhood of the best. Down the years, they have sought a common goal, victory in the Indianapolis 500. In 1925, Pete DiPaolo averaged 100 miles an hour. Today, 220 is the standard. In the 30s, the cars led the technology cast iron and shaped sheet metal. Today, titanium and carbon fiber define the ultimate racing machine. Space Age electronics now help tame the raging horsepower. Danger has always been a passenger. Like the track and the speed, it is a constant, ever present. It too is a part of the lure. Without that risk, the men are just ordinary. In a flash, a skilled drive transforms to disaster. But man can and does survive the machine. This spring has proven no exception. The fates strike at random. Rick Mears, one of the best. Mark Disborn, one of the rookies. Or veteran Randy Lewis. Each spent his moment over the edge. But man triumphs, as did Rick, a day later in a new car to take the pole at over 224 miles an hour. Now the heroes of this age wait. They weigh the odds, consider the risks, and they pray the dream today will be theirs. As much changes over 75 races, much stays the same. Skilled hands still lovingly caress and coax the ultimate performance. 34 years ago, A.J. Foyt was an apprentice. Today, he is a master, starting in the center of the front row. In 61, Tony Bentonhausen died chasing a victory. Today, his son may fulfill his father's dream. 26 years ago, the rookie stripes came off for Mario. Today, there are four Andretti's. Now, the 500's first African-American and first Japanese will join the line. Jewel Gu drank six bottles of champagne on his road to victory. Today, it's a frosty bottle of milk that awaits the eventual winner. That and so much more. The Yard of Bricks have witnessed the high-speed passage of history. In just a few hours, 500 miles from now, a 75th story will have been written, a new likeness will be added to a timeless silver cup, and a new name will sit atop the lineage of the greatest spectacle in racing, the Indianapolis 500. Live from the world's greatest race course, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, ABC Sports presents the 75th running of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. It has been raining in Indianapolis early in the morning, but as you can see, the track is drying. The start might be delayed by just a few minutes, but it sets the scene for what should be a spectacular day. And already the giant crowd has begun to fill this giant stadium. Rick Mears race car, he sits on the pole. They've just refueled that machine. And then of course, back in the garage area, all the cars being prepared at this moment ready to roll out to the line. And his garage, this car, number 14, A.J. Foyt, will start in the center of the front row. A.J. making his 34th consecutive start in the Indianapolis 500. And they work, too, in the Newman Haas stable on the Andretti cars, Michael and Mario, as they are ready for their running of the 500. And Mario having a last-minute conversation with Michael, perhaps some team thousand. strategy oh, yeah. before they are ready to begin their years. ride 500 <laughs> miles on a Sunday yeah, afternoon yeah. in Indianapolis. Well, this giant crowd is waiting now for the engines to roar into life, and the 500-mile ride will be underway. Welcome to race fans around the world. I'm Paul Page. This race is a pinnacle meeting in motorsports. When Carl Fisher first envisioned the Speedway, he saw a test facility, a crucible in which to forge the growing automobile industry. 
I wonder if Fisher had any idea of what his foresight would bring 80 years and 75 races later. Now each 500 is unique. It's filled with stories that feed a soaring spirit or pull at the heart. Each journey leads to greatness. What will today hold? Well, there are so many facets to the Diamond Anniversary Race. A.J. Foyt, Rick, the Andrettis. Here, the extraordinary is commonplace. We have so many great stories to share with you. As we move toward the start of the engines, we'll spend some very special minutes with A.J. Foyt and Gary Bentonhausen, the fastest man in the field. And we'll meet the 33 men who are ready to start the 500. Just outside the speedway, the crowd is still moving in on 16th Street pouring toward their seats, ready to see the anniversary, the 75th of the Indianapolis 500 mile race runnings. We'll be back with more right after this. One of the great advantages to this slight delay in the start of the Indianapolis 500 is we can elaborate on many of the wonderful stories that are occurring at the Speedway this year. One of those is the defending champion, Ari Leyendijk. Here's Jack Aroot. We're standing with Ari Leyendijk, a defending champion of the Indy 500, and Ari, a, a lot of flurry this morning because of the weather in the area. Now, you're back in row five, that famous row five with Gary Bettenhausen and M.O. How will the start of the race come off? A lot of people are expecting you to make a big move early. Well, it all depends how the start develops. I think we can only, uh, you know, make a, make a decision on what happens, and we'll just play it by ear. If, if the track opens up and there's uh, room for me to go to the front, I'll go to the front. If I need to take my time, I'll take my time. It's uh, hopefully going to be a 500 mile race today and not a shortened race. And uh, with 500 miles to go, we have plenty of time. Some of the crew were saying there's not a patient bone in Ari's body. That's why we like him so much. He's aggressive. Remember 88 when you started back in row five? What happened on lap one? Well, I basically went from 15th to seventh place in one lap. But, you know, I had uh, I didn't have the equipment I have now. I know that my equipment, I can win with my equipment. Back then, I wasn't sure if I could win, so I had to do the best I could. and. Uh, it's a whole different ball game this year. I think I have uh, one of the best crews out there. The RCA car is running great. And uh, with CNG as a new backer, we should be doing really well this, this year. A defending Indy 500 winner, Ari Leindijk, back in row five. Alongside him is a guy standing with Jack Aru. And Jerry, this man has been beaming all month. He is the fastest man in the field with Buick V6 power. Gary Bettenhausen, who has such a long, historic relationship with the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This has been your month, Gary. Well, yes, Jack, and you, you said I was the fastest driver in the field. I, I think I'm just driving the fastest car in the field. Uh, the race car has really been fantastic all month, and, uh, you know, I, I owe thanks to a lot of people, my car owner, John Menard, mainly for having faith in me last year, and our sponsors, Glidden, Crestline, and Ruan. They've just been fantastic to me. But you're back in that fifth row. Now, that makes the start a little hairy. We've seen some crazy starts here. Are you at all concerned, and how will you approach it? No, I'm not too concerned, because I think everybody that's starting in the first five rows, are, well, every, there's a, all the race drivers yeah. in this field are good race drivers, and I don't think uh, anybody's going to do anything foolish at the start. Now, with the weather back and forth the way it has been the co last couple of days, we've had intermittent rain showers, and does that change your strategy at all, the possibility that this race may not go 500 miles? Do you look at it differently? No, it sounds like the window is going to be uh, long enough that we can get the race in, and uh, we'll naturally we'll have our crew in contact with the weather, and we'll watch what's happening uh, around the area, and uh, we're going to have to stay close to the leaders, though, that's for sure. You're beginning to tighten up a little bit. You were real loose the last couple of days, but there seems to be a little tension brewing. No, not really. I, uh, this place, I know it's a job and it's a business, and I've been here many years, and uh, I don't change just because it's race time. Paul? Gary Bentonhausen has done it so many times before. Of course, he referenced the start. It's one of the most spectacular moments in sports, but all of the drivers study it carefully because when things go wrong, they can go very wrong, as it did in 1973. Jim Ratson takes the base car off the track. He should get the green right now. Doesn't look like a repeat of last year's start. No, it's a good one. And here they come. Bobby Unser going for the lead. Johnny Rutherford right alongside him. Rutherford down low, but Bobby with a terrible crash for the home stretch. There are several cars involved. We can't see the numbers, but it's been a bad crash for the start. It was in the middle of the field somewhere. Incredible thing. Explosion. This is what everyone has feared. This is why there's been such a terrible atmosphere of fear here all week. 
weekend long. It's a shame there's a driver waving. He might be on fire, that man, the way he's waving. You can't see an alcohol fire. Those explosions are not cars. Those are the bombs overhead that are normally set off during the start of the race. There is a report already that there may be spectators hurt, not confirmed. The wire fence right here on the straightaway was ripped apart. It was very fortunate that a car did not come into the crowd because one of the standards holding up the wire screen has also been broken in half. Right here at the most crowded part of the grandstand, we almost had an automobile go into the crowd. And it appears definitely that uh, there are spectators injured, but here's a replay of what happened here. He was back in the sixth or seventh row, this car. Conjecture that it might have been salt water, but watch. There's a car going, starting to the right. Right there, and look at this. An incredible explosion, fuel spraying out over the spectators in the first few rows. That could mean real trouble. And an explosion, and like a pinwheel or a garden sprinkler, all the fuel is being sprayed out of the car. That could be a good thing for the driver if he has survived this crash. Car upside down, coming to a rest. Another view of this from a head-on camera. And again, you will see how this the cable, cables inside this screen are the only thing to stop this car from flying into the crowd. There, watch now, the screen itself is completely destroyed. The cables flinging him back out on the race course upside down, and again, that fuel spraying on the crowd. That's a matter of great concern. And here, that pinwheel effect. The alcohol-based fuel spinning out of the car upside down. Another car, Lee Koonsman, I believe, number 16, barely missing the crash. It's Salt Walther, who is under the car. Terrible, terrible accident on the start at Indianapolis. Only seven seconds after the start of the race. No serious injuries as a result of that 1973 accident, but you can see since then they have reconfigured the seating along the main straightaway to account for that possibility in the future. Another aspect, too, is we saw fire in that accident, and since that time, the research and safety development with the Indy cars has been so excellent that fire is almost not a factor in accidents any longer. Well, we continue to move toward the start of this race, a little delayed because of a rain shower early this morning. So many wonderful stories. Another one is Willie T. Ribs, and he right now is with Gary Gerald. Indeed, it's been a tremendous story. The emotion of qualifying day for Willie T. Ribs. I know this has been a lifelong dream to make this race. The moment is almost here. It's been delayed a bit. What kind of emotions have you gone through this morning leading now to your first ever Indianapolis 500? Well, um, it was raining, so I got a little extra sleep and just <laughs> took it easy. You know, when, when it's time to race, you go race. But prior to that, you relax. No, uh, don't worry about anything. Nothing's going to change other than the weather. Willie, have you been at all surprised at the reception? Because there was a lot of cynicism five years ago and the opportunity wasn't right. You elected to turn away. Now you're back and suddenly you have become like the, the hero, the champion of the underdog, so to speak, because the people here have really been caught up in the saga of no sponsorship until just before the race. Well, before... You know, before we got here and before qualifying, we were struggling. And we were very limited with our budget. Uh, and everything worked out. We qualified and we qualified well. And the support after that has been tremendous from McDonald's and, and, uh, and the other sponsors that we have acquired. It's been tremendous. I can't thank everyone, and as well as the people uh, that have supported me uh, and fans and friends. I can't thank them enough. We wish you safety this day. Have fun in your first. We hope there are many more. Thank you. All right, Paul. Well, the track crews have been very, very effective in drying this track, and it looks like we are moving very close to the start of the race. When we come back, though, we'll have a chance to look at the closest finish in history as we approach the start of the 75th Indy 500. Some of the preliminary ceremonies are underway already on the main stretch. The Purdue All-American Band making their two and a half mile an hour tour. You saw the 73 start. At the end of that race, Gordon Johncock won the 1973 run. Right now, he's with Jack Aroot. And Gordon Johncock was on a, uh, a sabbatical for the last couple of days. You weren't feeling well, Gordon, but 
now you are going to run starting 33rd? Well, I'm going to run. Uh, I've ran when I'm a lot worse shape than I am right now. Uh, it seems like when you get out there and, and the adrenaline gets flowing, you get started and go, uh, you forget about being sick. You talk about adrenaline. There was a lot flowing when you had that close, close victory over Rick Mears. What are your memories of that? Well, I just remember him coming on a second in a lap. You know, I was watching him in my mirrors, and my car just kept getting worse and worse every lap, you know, and I didn't think I'd really be able to stay out in front and hold him off. Now, you're the second oldest driver in this field. Of course, the oldest, A.J. Foyt. Will you keep coming back till you beat A.J.'s record? That's very possible. But uh, I don't know. Uh, A.J. says it's last year, but uh, I myself, I don't, I don't really believe it. And you're going to tell us how old you are? 54. Yeah, he may be off by a year or so, though, Paul. Gordon Johncock, very likable two-time winner of the Indianapolis 500. 1982, one of the closest finishes in history, and Johncock was a key player. but frustration there. Now watch this. Making the move as they come to the finish line. There's Mears moving up, moving up, and it was just a little over a car length, about 20 feet. And of course, all of this history weaves together. There's Emerson Fittipaldi, winner two years ago, and Roger Penske, the winningest car owner at the Speedway. And in the field, of course, Roger's other driver, Rick Mears, starts on the pole. Gordon Johncock starts in 33rd position. Now there are the 
corporate suites that overlook the fourth turn. There are many ways to view the Indianapolis 500. You could sit up there as a VIP guest. General Norman Schwarzkopf is up there, for example, today. Or you can buy a ticket into the massive grandstands here, about 300,000 of those available. Or you can come like so many do and just join us in the infield, which is full of mud today and a little bit tougher to see the race from. Now let's go back down trackside. Danny Sullivan is with Gary Gerald. He's been in the garage area, Paul, just uh, 15 minutes or so. Came over from the Speedway Motel in the golf cart, uh, has now gotten dressed, and the waiting game continues. And we were just talking about how difficult this is on the emotions because regardless of what any driver says, this is a whole different environment at Indianapolis. Well, that's true. Of course, we've been here, you know, for three weeks, the buildup, the parties, everything, the testing every day. That just keeps swelling and swelling until now, and you're you're ready to go. We were ready two days ago, and you're ready to run. And now with this rain, you know, it's on, it's off. They say there's a cloud behind this one, you know. You, you don't know really what to do with your butterflies and your emotions. What kind of a game plan do you have for this race? Because we know that it's been an ongoing struggle to get the horsepower, to get the straightaway speed, to be competitive with some of the other front runners who grabbed the headlines this month. Well, for us, I think the big thing, particularly with the weather, is we've got to try to stay on the leader lap. We've got to try to, try to stay there because come 101 laps, this race could be called if it rains any time after that. We've got to try to stay there and hope that uh, we're in contention when it gets close to the end of the race. You've been through this drill so many times in the past. Any special or unusual emotions on this race day? Not really. I think a little bit different because, as you said, we haven't been one of the guys setting the pace, so we're not the contender in the way we have been in years past. And uh, we're, we just got to keep trying to work on it and get just consistent and run on the leader lap the whole race. Danny Sullivan from row three as we go back up to Paul Page. And as Danny Sullivan will tell you, no one ever does it alone. It takes the work of a top flight crew to win at Indianapolis. There's also a chance for the crew to shine for just a bit. Earlier this week on Thursday, the Miller Pit Stop Contest was that moment. Following Thursday's final on-track practice, a huge crowd packed the Tower Terrace grandstands for the 15th renewal of the Miller Genuine Draft Pit Stop Championship. The first semifinal pairing matched A.J. Foyt's crew against the Patrick Racing Team backing Danny Sullivan. At the drop of the green, each team was free to go. Each six-man crew electronically timed from the moment the car enters the pit box to the time it leaves the designated pit area. Each team was required to change four tires and connect their fueling equipment. Sullivan had no trouble advancing to the finals despite a five-second penalty for having a man over the wall too soon. Sullivan's crew got the break it needed when problems with a stubborn right front wheel left Foyt fuming in the cockpit in frustration. Eventually, the stop was completed, but the only consolation for the Foyt crew was a $5,000 prize and the hope that there'd be no reoccurrence of such problems race day. The second semifinal matchup had Bobby Rahal and the Gallus Preco team going against Mario Andretti and the Newman Haas crew. As each team came over the wall into action, it looked like a classic showdown. Each crew flawless, completing their assigned task in a fraction over 13 seconds. But as the cars came down off the jacks and Ray Hall pulled away, Mario's car stalled. And the jubilant Ray Hall crew was on the way to the finals against Sullivan, much to the dismay of Mario's backers. At stake in the finals, $25,000 to the winners, $15,000 to the runners up. At the drop of starter Dwayne Sweeney's green flag, Sullivan was away quickly and into the pit box well ahead of Ray Hall. But keep in mind that the separate timing of each team didn't start until the car tripped the timing light entering the pit. Sullivan's crew, that had survived preliminary competition against 10 other teams, completed their work in 13.1 seconds, barely holding off a gallant late bid by Ray Hall's crew that proved to be just two tenths of a second slower. For Sullivan, the victory was his fourth, a record for the Miller competition, but the first for the Patrick Racing Alfa Romeo team. And of course, that um, Miller Pit Stop Contest is just part of the many festivities, both here at the track and with the 500 Festival, to continue throughout the week before the running of the race. The track is drying very nicely now. Let's take this time for another installment in our continuing series on what's new in sports, science, and technology. Spend a little more time on this leg. Is it, do you notice more with your right leg? 
We're back live as Emerson Fittipaldi, who is a physical fitness fanatic, is making his final preparations before the start of the race with the help of a trainer. Now let's go to Jack Aroot, who is with our pole sitter. That man is Rick Mears, and Rick, you're waiting out this uh, rain delay as they continue to dry the track inside the confines of your garage. What are your concerns, though? Has the, has the concerns changed now that you know we've had some wet? No, not really. I think, uh, you know, we, we ran in so many different conditions this month so far. I think we've uh, found the car seems to handle all of them fairly equal. So really the only thing I think today so far, other than the rain, if it rains some more, would be the wind blowing. The wind's blowing pretty hard, which would make turn three and four a little sensitive. Now, what will that do to you inside the race car if you do hit that wind? Well, it basically, it'll, it'll make the car understeer or push in turn three, try to blow the nose out from under you. And then turning into turn four, where you're turning back into the wind, and it'll kind of pin the nose of the car and make the car loose. So it's going to, it, you're going to have to have a little bit broader setup on balance. You're going to have to live with a little bit more one way or the other to, to help cure those problems. A terrific front row. You're on the pole. What will be your first lap strategy? Well, we're going to try to get a jump if we can. And, uh, you know, we always want to try to get the jump, and if we get it, that's great. And, you know, we'll try to lead it. If not, we're going to fall in line like normal and, uh, you know, just kind of sit there and bide our time, see what the track conditions are like, stay in the hunt, and uh, hopefully be ready at the end. A lot of people saying you might let A.J. Foyt lead that first lap. <laughs> well, we're good friends and everything, and I'm tickled for A.J., but uh, racing's racing, and I'm sure he'd do the same thing. Paul? Let's remember, too, that every time he's been on the pole, he has never led the first lap. General Norman Schwarzkopf. Boy, the crowd is pleased that he is here today visiting the 500 mile race for his first time. And just before the rains began to fall here, dampening the track, some 3,000 troops that served in the Gulf War marched around this track, and despite the rain, the crowd came out and watched that. Happen. Well, you can see that track is drying very quickly, just a little bit of moisture down inside toward the pit wall itself. Now, let's go to Gary Gerald. He's with Mario Andretti. And Paul, it's funny that you mentioned General Schwarzkopf because Mario Andretti had dinner with the general last night. I, I'm sure that was a great experience. Well, it was a lot of, quite a bit of quality time with him at uh, Mary Holman's party last night. And um, it was just, uh, to me, it was uh, just an incredible pleasure to be able to meet him. And, uh, and he's everything that I expected. He just, uh, he just portrays the confidence that uh, all of us know already that, uh, you know, from the job that, it, that the troops uh, have done over there in the in the Persian Gulf. Mario, of course, starts outside in the front row, and over the years, many have said that that's the best place to start this race. You've got A.J. to your left, and Rick Mears on the inside, and a lot of speculation about the first lap. How much have you really thought about lap number one of this 500-mile race? Well, you think about it, of course, because uh, you want to get it right, but uh, obviously, you just uh, you can't speculate with yourself too much because you just don't know what the other guys are going to do, so... Uh, it's going to be a matter of who really gets the so-called hole shot out of turn four and uh, what gear races are. So whoever gets into that first corner uh, first obviously will get the corner. A lot of experience. This is the 26th time that Mario Andretti has been through this drill. He's hoping that for the second time he'll end up in victory lane. Paul? What a wonderful moment. Mario and this man, General Norman Schwarzkopf, as he now makes a tour of the speedway. Apparently the officials here are very confident in the drying of the track because they're sending these celebrity cars out onto the racetrack. And look at the crowd. Everyone on their feet, the cheers are magnificent. Now, Mario Andretti won driving for Andy Granatelli. Granatelli was known for innovation here at the Speedway, and in the middle 60s, that innovation was just incredible. Let's go back and look at the turbine-powered cars. This is the Whooshmobile, designed for three years in secret by Andy Granatelli. It was called Wishmobile because of the distinctive sound made by its power plant, a Pratt & Whitney aircraft turbine. The car was ultra-modern, all-wheel drive, a monocoque chassis, and even a flap in the back that would jump up and air brake the car whenever the driver touched the brake pedal. The driver was the great Parnelli Jones, and in 1967, with this car, he dominated most of the 500. The turbine was, without question, the talk of Gasoline Alley with its unique features. Many of the drivers complained about the air brake jumping up at the back of the car and frightening them as they headed into the corners. 
Still, each time out to practice, the fear of this magnificent machine grew in Gasoline Alley. Parnelli Jones would start sixth on the grid with a qualifying time just over 166 miles an hour. Mario Andretti would sit on the pole at nearly 169 miles an hour. But as the green flag came out, it became evident that nothing could match the brute speed of Granatelli's turbine. Jones motored into the lead halfway down the backstretch of the opening lap. The only person that could slow Parnelli down that day was the weatherman. Heavy rains hit the speedway after 19 laps and the race was postponed. Jones picked up where he left off the following day. A number of wrecks depleted the field. Wally Dallenbach was the victim of an accident. As was Leroy Yarborough, George Snyder, and Johnny Rutherford. The caution light would flash for over an hour. But then the unthinkable happened in the waning laps. An inexpensive rear end bearing broke, and the turbine was powerless. The despondent STP crew, headed by Andy Granatelli, kept looking northward for the appearance of their car. Finally, they saw the machine creeping at a snail's pace, obviously destined to go no further. After leading 172 laps, Parnelli's day was done. Andy Granatelli could only stare in disbelief at his silent and failed dream. A.J. Foyt moved into the lead now with just four laps to go. But his path to a third victory was momentarily blocked when Bobby Grimm, Chuck Hulse, Carl Williams, and Bud Tinglestead, along with Larry Dixon, crashed on the final lap. A.J. suspected trouble and slowed down and was able to snake his way through the wreckage and take the checkered flag to join the elite list of three-time winners at the Indy 500. The turbine would come back to try again, only to eventually be rendered ineffective by changes in the rules. And while that winner in 1967 may have changed just a little bit, the intensity still burns so great. 34 years, A.J. Foyt, and now you're You've had to delay your final start at the Indianapolis 500 by half hour or so. What are your thoughts right now? Well, I just hope we have a real fast race, a good safe race, and just may the best man win. And I'm looking forward to it. It's the first race I've been back since I've been injured and uh, kind of looking forward to get back in the seat again. Middle of that front row, though, that, that leaves you in a position where can you dictate the start or do you have to follow what Rick Mears does? Well, I like to be able to dictate the start, but uh, you got to follow the pole man. He sets the pace, and uh, actually Mario's got the, the nice slot on the starting position, but uh, a lot depends on how we all accelerate. You know, a lot of times these guys accelerate good, sometimes they don't, and a lot depends on how we come up. If we accelerate good, we'll be right there. If we don't, uh, we just fall back and wait. What, eight months ago when you were just starting your rehabilitation, did you ever really in your own mind believe that you could be here? Well, I've always felt like when I put my mind to doing something, I can do it. Uh, I know a lot of people didn't think we'd be back, but I said I'd be back, and that was my goal, and I reached it. Well, congratulations, A.J. Paul? Isn't it incredible how calm A.J. looks before the start of his race? Emerson Fittipaldi won two years ago. He's with Jerry Punch. M.O. is extremely relaxed here, as always, in the garage area. It's a two-time uh, national champion, world champion. M.O., starting back in row five. You're not accustomed to being back there. Concerned at the start of the race? Well, I'm sure it's going to be a uh, much more difficult where I'm starting. I, I'm starting good company with Vary Leindach and Gary Bettenhaus. But uh, it'll, it'll be a lot of traffic. It'll be, uh, you know, difficult. I would say the mainly the first 20 laps, you have to be careful, more conservative than if I would start on the front. Now, we saw you moments ago with Jim Landis back there doing some stretching, some movement. Uh, what was that for? Well, you know, I think the stretch always helps. You know, I'll be sitting in the cockpit for three and a half hours, possible. And, uh, you know, it's nice to be relaxed, nice, nice to be, you know, stretch up and warm up to go and, and do a good race. Now, it's difficult enough to focus on the task at hand, 500 miles, but your wife, Teresa, eight and a half months pregnant, will be sitting in the pits. Uh, you're going to have to wander a little bit and think about her. Well, I told her to wait after the race, and uh, like last night, I said, don't make sure the baby don't come tonight. I have to have a good night's sleep, but she hold it. And now she has to hold it for the race. The crew said they made this radio M.O. during one of the laps and say, M.O., it's a boy. Back to you, Paul. M.O. would like to be in the car much shorter time, two hours, 41 minutes, the record time here set last year. So many wonderful stories, so many great drivers in this 500-mile race, the 75th running. So now let's begin to meet the drivers in the 75th running of the Indianapolis 500.
The field is the traditional 11 rows of three. We'll start in the back with position 33 and move toward the front. In the 11th row, from the inside out, is Randy Lewis, Pancho Carter, and two-time winner Gordon Johncock. It was just two weeks ago that Gordy was working his farm when he got a call to come and drive the Indy 500. In 1982, he won by 16 one-hundredths of a second, the closest 500 ever. The 10th row is made up of three very persevering men, Roberto Guerrero, Willie T. Ribs, and Dominic Dobson. Dominic crashed hard two weeks ago, chipping a bone in his leg. But the team bought another car, and now with a knee brace on his leg, he's ready for his fourth ending. History was made when Willie T. Ribs became the first African-American to join the field. In 1987, Roberto Guerrero's engine stalled while leading to give the race to Al Unter. In the ninth row, John Paul Jr. in his third 500, Finland's Taro Pomrod, and Scott Pruitt. It was just a year ago March when Scotty was injured in a testing accident at West Palm Beach, Florida. Since that time, he has been in constant rehabilitation just to prepare to drive in this race. The eighth row has two rookies and a veteran, Jeff Brabham in his ninth race, Buddy Lazier and Hiro Mashusta. Mashusta is the first Japanese to drive in the 500. He relaxes shooting pool. Buddy Lazier is a skier and operates a resort with his Indy driver dad. Jeff Brabham sits in his dad's number 17, the first successful rear engine car from back in 1961. The back four rows have one former winner, three rookies, and the slowest car in the field. And we'll meet more of the starting field in just a little bit. Still cloudy over Indianapolis, but the track for the moment is very, very dry. We will start right on time. You know, almost every profession or craft uses a shortcut in language to describe very complex things. Racing is no different. Here are some simple terms that express much more complex ideas. For example, we may say a car is pushing. Push or understeer is the tendency of the car to continue straight after the wheels are turned. The best example of push came in 1988 with Danny Sullivan. Now watch his hands as he turned the car, went straight, and he pushed into the wall. The opposite of push is loose or oversteer, when the back end tries to slide out once the wheels are turned. Three years ago, Scott Brayton got loose in the Indy 500. The back end swerved out. He overcorrected, fought the car, and lost to the loose condition. We also refer to the stagger setting. Stagger is making the right rear tire slightly larger in diameter than the left rear. It helps the car turn left easier because the right rear is driving the car into the corner. The short shoots are straights that link between the first and second and third and fourth turns. In the race itself, we'll refer to the move-over flag. The starter will display this flag to advise another driver another car is following closely. Now, sometimes a driver will be black flagged. That means you report to your pit, where a race official will either check your car for safety or reprimand you for a violation. Over in the third turn, a guard section and the American flag, patriotism, rampant in this country at this time. And the celebrities continue to circle the track, and the officials of this race getting more and more confident have already begun their countdown to the start of the engines. They say just 43 and a half minutes away, and the 75th running of the Great Indianapolis 500 will be underway. Stay with us, it should be a most exciting afternoon. Floating over the speedway now, the Airship America. It travels about 20 miles an hour. The race cars, a good 200 miles an hour faster. The Goodyear blimp, about 1,000 feet up. There's the shot down as we count down to the start of the engines. Well, this has been a most emotional year at Indianapolis, and many of the emotions have focused on a single man. Here's the story, as told by Sam Posey to his son, John. Dad, who's the greatest racing driver ever? Well, a long time ago, when winning depended more on the driver than the car, the very best was a man from Texas named A.J. Foyt. A.J. Foyt? Did he win the Indy 500? You bet. He won it four times. Well, what was he like? His dad, Tony, owned a garage, so A.J. grew up around cars, and the first time he drove, he was just eight years old. 
He took a midget out of the garage and running around in the backyard out there and until he hit the side of the house with it and set it on fire. And I was out of town at another midget race. AJ loved driving dirt tracks where you have to really wrestle with your car. The other drivers were afraid of him. Sometimes he'd get into fights and beat them up. But when he went to Indy, he knew it was a big step, knew it was his turn to be afraid. That race morning, I was a, a nervous wreck saying, is this what I want to do for a living or not? And they dropped the green flag, and if you recall, that's when they had the bad accident. On that very first lap, a driver was killed, a driver who was one of AJ's friends. No, I'd be truthful with you, I was very nervous and very scared. And I saw a good friend of mine, Pat O'Connor, lose his life, you know, and uh, which I respected highly. And uh, I said to myself, this might be too rough of a game for A.J. Foyt. It was rough in those days. 13 of the drivers who started in A.J.'s first Indy would be killed racing. So A.J. decided it was better not to have too many friends. But he had his dad, so he wasn't lonely. And then he won Indy and he beat a great driver named Eddie Sachs. Three years later, AJ won Indy again, but it was a black day. Two drivers got killed, and one of them was Eddie Sachs. AJ Foyt was tough. AJ Foyt survived. In his third win, he came from way behind, refusing to give up. Where's Foyt? I don't know whether he can get through or not. There he is. AJ Foyt will win the Indianapolis 500. In those days, AJ would drive anything, and he won more races in different kinds of cars than anyone ever had. The fans loved him. He was what racing was all about the danger, the speed, the glory. AJ won his fourth Indy driving a car he and his dad had built themselves, engine and all. They had won, but racing was beginning to change, and soon the things AJ was so good at wouldn't matter so much. The new idea was to build cars a lot like airplanes, which made them very expensive. Car owners such as Roger Penske wore suits, not t-shirts, and they had computers and wind tunnels. They built cars in factories, while AJ and his dad had only their shop. AJ didn't want to raise money and wear a suit. He wanted to race. I'm just going to do whatever AJ wants to do. And I guess I'm a little bit hard-headed, a little bit stubborn, uh, and got a lot of pride. And uh, it's either a lot of times my way or the highway, and, and I, I don't think I'll ever change from that. Did AJ ever crash? Oh, lots of times. But once in 1965, he crashed so bad he broke his back and had to spend weeks in the hospital. Really? While he was in the hospital that time, his dad got him to thinking about having a ranch, a place to go to relax between races. Together, they cut down the trees, built the fences, and A.J. got his son to help raise horses, horses for racing, of course. By the early 1980s, A.J. was winning less often. His dad had died, his mom too. He'd been happiest when his dad was proud of him. Suddenly, he was lost. I'd have to say after he died, I was there, but I really wasn't there. I guess what I mean by that, I got in a car, I had no enthusiasm about winning. I didn't care if the crew worked good. And I let myself get way behind. I just did it because it was just kind of a job. Just couldn't realize they were gone. And then once I woke up and said, they're gone, they wouldn't want me to act like this. And I've changed my attitude a lot. Did he stop racing? No, but he was planning to. Trouble was, A.J. wanted to race one more time the way he used to. You mean like when he was the best? Yeah, but then a terrible thing happened. It was late last summer. A.J.'s brakes failed and he smashed into a dirt bank. His legs and feet were crushed and in his pain, he had a dream and he thought his dad was with him, even though he knew his dad was dead. When I got hurt, I felt like I talked to my father. I know that sounds crazy. But like he come there, he talked to me, said everything's gonna be all right, and then he just disappeared again. Pins and screws held his legs together. One, two, three, four, five. Then a strange thing happened. AJ realized getting better would be a challenge a lot like the old days, 
when he was able to do the impossible. There you go, that's better. Although he was by now 56, he amazed his doctors with his tolerance for pain. And the more people said he wouldn't be ready for Indy, the more he wanted to prove them wrong. Come on, you gotta go now. Come on, that's a better ball. Come on, push! It was a race against time, and he won. The track is open for qualification. For four laps, he made time stand still. He reached into the past for the greatness that had been his, but that he had lost. Maybe he thought his dad was watching, and that made him try even harder. Racing has really been my whole life. Uh, I love racing. It's going to be hard to leave. I just want to be remembered as just AJ, and that's about it. You know, nothing special. I mean, just AJ. Since 1958, much of the history of this great race has revolved around this man, A.J. Foyt. He's seen it all here. Today, perhaps he will see a fifth time in victory lane. The countdown continues to the start of the Indy 500. He's the vice president today, but of course, he's also a Hoosier. And like so many Hoosiers, as a boy, he started coming to this race. Now he circles the track. We take a look now as we continue with the starting field. Some of the fastest cars will actually start in the mid-pack of this field. Continuing to look at the fastest field in history. In the seventh row, from the inside to the outside, are Midwesterners Scott Brayton and Tony Bentenhausen. Outside, Mexico's Bernard Jourdain. The sixth row, inside, is Kevin Kogan. In the center of the row is Stan Fox. And outside, the fastest rookie, Mike Groff. Groff loves to restore old cars and old homes in his spare time. Wisconsin Stan Fox is a top midget racer. And Californian Kevin Kogan drives a Buick today, but he flies his own plane in his other life as a real estate developer. Row five is the fastest in the field, with the fastest driver, Gary Bentenhausen, the defending champion, Ari Leyendijk, and the 89 winner, Emerson Fittipaldi. Emmo works out daily. He adds to his health regimen by keeping to a special diet that includes seaweed. Today, he drives a Penske Chevrolet. Ari Leyendijk won the first race of his career here last year, earning a million dollars. Now the man from Holland is able to pursue his second love by opening an art gallery. Ari drives the number one Lola Chevrolet. Gary Bentenhausen lives in rural Indiana. His family has dreamed of an Indy win for two generations. Today is his best chance in the number 51 Lola Buick. So, Gary Bentenhausen may, in fact, have a chance here today. Now, of course, the story of Gary Bentenhausen as the fastest car in the field is so much more than just that. It's a story of a legacy here at the Indianapolis 500. Sam Posey has this report. Gary Bettenhausen's father, Tony, raced at Indy in the 1950s. But Tony would die at the Speedway, and the legacy he left his three sons was his unfulfilled dream of winning the race. The family's luck, however, has been all bad. Gary led, but his car broke down. His brother, Merle, lost his arm in Michigan, and Gary's arm was crushed in this sprint car crash. Two weeks ago, the Bettenhausen's strange destiny again hung in the air. Gary made the fastest qualifying run of the year, the story of 1991. But the result was bittersweet. The run came a day too late to put him on the pole, and it fell exactly on the 30th anniversary of his father's death. My wife and I talked about that on the way in. But it's a better day today. What would it mean to him to win the race? Unbelievable. I can't even explain it, I don't think. You know, it's, I'd have to wait, and if it ever happens, then I'll tell you what it means. One of the many wonderful stories as we look back through Gasoline Alley. 
These are the garages back on the other side of that grandstand. The drivers have begun to move to the track. There's Gary Bentonhausen along with his brother Murray. Since 1946, a Bentonhausen has made this walk through Gasoline Alley 44 times. It's the 19th time for this man, Gary Bentonhausen. Of course, he drives today with still some paralysis in his left arm as a result of a sprint car accident years ago. So Gary Bentonhausen starts on the inside of the fifth row, the fastest row in the field. But then there is that marvelous veteran front row. And Posey? Well, it almost seems that, Paul, fate must have stepped in to create this fabulous front row of Mears, Foyt, and Andretti, a kind of Mount Rushmore of racing. It's hard to believe they were once kids. Rick with his long hair out in the desert with a dune buggy, AJ getting into brawls in the pits, Mario, the young immigrant from Italy, sailing past the Statue of Liberty. Today, they are legends, but each knows that much of his fame rests on his exploits here, and that today's race is as important as any he has ever run. Now, because of its importance, this race becomes more difficult each year, doesn't it, Bobby Unser? Well, Sam, there is no place in racing that puts pressure on a driver like here at Indianapolis. In racing, a driver realizes that if he wins Indy, he'll be immortalized, and the pressures come from everywhere. A driver's hometown, the vast world media, approximately 500,000 fans here at the track, and many millions of people watching TV and listening to the radio all over the world. A lot of people ask me, do the drivers really get butterflies before the race? Now, I don't care whether you're a rookie or a 34-year veteran. It's solid knots in the stomach, at least until the green flag drops. Well, in the state of Indiana, the Speedway is the second largest city on race day. Crowd approaching nearly half a million people. And the cars have begun now to make their appearance in the pit area. The crew is laboring over them. And here comes the 85 winner, Danny Sullivan. <laughs> the drill team and Danny's teammate Roberto Guerrero already well down the pit road with his lovely wife Katie very special moment of these drivers move now toward joining their teams and cars ten wins have come from the first rower rows in the 500 as we continue our look at the starting field the front four rows all qualified on the first day of time trials. In the fourth row, on the inside is Eddie Cheever, Jeff Andretti in the center, and Canadian Scott Goodyear to the outside. With the addition of Mario's younger son, Jeff, plus Michael and their cousin, John, 12% of this field are named Andretti. Eddie Cheever sweated the last month here in Indianapolis preparing for this race. His wife, Rita, chose instead to stay at their Monaco home but she's here today to watch him drive in Chip Ganassi's number eight Lola Chevrolet. In the third row, on the inside, John Andretti, Jim Crawford in the center, Danny Sullivan to the outside. In 1985, Danny Sullivan spun and then won his first Indianapolis 500. He is a modern man of many personalities. The real Danny Sullivan will start this race in the number 20 Alfa Romeo driving for the Pat Patrick Racing Stable. Last year, Jim Crawford took flight in practice here. The transplanted Scotsman still limps from a crash in qualifying in 1987 that forced him out of racing for a year. But Jim is back, driving again for drag racer Kenny Bernstein in a Lola powered by Buick. John Andretti and his father Aldo share a love of racing history. Aldo is Mario's twin brother. John won his first IndyCar race in March, driving the Lola Chevy for the Hall VDS team. 14 winners have come from the second row. Today inside is Bobby Rahal, then Michael Andretti, and Al Unser Jr. outside. 
Little Al is an avid outdoorsman. The defending PPG Cup champion is the sole representative of the Unser clan today. He drives a Lola Chevrolet. This may be Michael Andretti's last 500. He began testing for the McLaren Formula One team this year, and if he has his way, he'll drive only in F1 for the next several years. His best finish here is fourth in 1988. He hasn't finished the last two years, but today he drives the Newman Haas Lola Chevrolet. Bobby Rahal is on a fitness campaign, cycling with friends daily. The 1986 500 winner has finished second in every race this year. He carries Maury Crane's blue and yellow livery on his number 18 Lola Chevrolet. 71 Indy 500 starts are in the veteran first row. Pole sitter Rick Mears, four-time winner A.J. Foyt, and Mario Andretti, who drove to victory here in 1969 for Andy Granatelli. A year and a half ago, Mario took up golf as a counterpoint to the tensions of the track. In the last 11 years, the former world champion has only finished twice. He starts in his 26 500 in the Newman Haas Lola Chevrolet. Anthony Joseph Foyt Jr., the first four-time winner. A record 67 championship wins. The only man to win here in both front and rear engine cars. The oldest driver in the field at age 56, A.J. starts his number 14 in his 34th straight 500. Away from the track, Bakersfield, California's Rick Mears loves the water. It relaxes him while he plans even greater victories. He starts on the pole for a record six times. But it was just two and a half weeks ago that Rick Mears slammed the first turn wall in the only wreck he's ever had at Indianapolis. Twice in 1979 and 88, he's won from the pole. He starts today driving a Penske Chevrolet. In the front four rows, there are four former winners and four members of the Andretti family. And so appropriately, they all walk out into the pit area together. There's John, his wife, Nancy. Michael and Mario. Mario holds hands with his wife Sandy as they prepare for the 500. Counting today, the Andretti family has 39 collective starts, but only 11 times have they gone the distance. John Andretti, his new colors for this year, Jeff Andretti. That's the youngest of the family, Michael's younger brother. Mario's youngest son. The vice President continues to make his rounds on the track itself. In these times of renewed patriotism, the country is still concerned about the troops abroad. Danny Sullivan and Scott Pruitt visited the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt, still on station in the Eastern Mediterranean. The TR, CVN-71, and its squadrons have been at sea since last December. There is a close relationship between race drivers and jet pilots, similar attitudes. Danny and Scott fit right in. For the ship's captain, a gift of Danny's helmet, with Scott following up with a presentation to the group admiral. To a man, the crew is thankful the drivers would take time to visit, as the TR still stands vigil over troops in the Middle East. Nice to meet you. How you doing? The Theodore Roosevelt will remain at sea for another month, but today they were focused on the IndyCar drivers. The drivers focused on their high-tech equipment. These crews are proud of their planes, their ship, and the role they played in the Gulf War. Those little holes, that'd be just like a pothole? Yeah, probably. The morning's flights launched. They cleared the flight deck to stage the TR-500, a race among the crew's RC cars. Afterward, it was cheers for the IndyCar drivers. The crew of the CVN-71 play hard and work harder. Here, Danny and Scott were spectators to the most advanced technology of all, a U.S. Navy nuclear carrier and its squadrons. In two days aboard, they added 5,000 new fans to the Indy 500. What a marvelous trip that was for those racing drivers. Emerson Fittipaldi went along as well as they visited the Sigonella Naval Air Station in Sicily. The crowd, for the most part, in their seats, and many of them are soldiers that served in the Gulf War. Over 3,000 of them. They were all part of a march down the main straightaway a little bit earlier, looking forward to the running of the 500 miles. The crowd, despite the rain at that time, 
stayed right out next to the track so they could applaud these heroes as they moved around the speedway. So appropriate on this the Memorial Day weekend. You can see that uh, most of the people are in their seats, but there's still quite a line. That's 16th Street, just outside the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Still quite a line there. Vice President Dan Quayle has completed now his tour of the track. There's an important moment for Willie T. Ribs as he meets the Vice President. What a marvelous month of May it has been for Willie T. So difficult in so many ways. And now the rewards are here. A place in the 500 field, a historic spot. The cars are still in the pit area. They have not yet moved the machines out into their positions, the 11 rows of three on the grid. Danny Quayle still talking with Willie T. Ribs. You know, this race on this weekend, Memorial Weekend, is a part of the American fabric. Here's our SAS Jack Whitaker with some more thoughts. Thank you, Paul. As a matter of fact, the Indianapolis 500 is America's Memorial Day. It is the day when all of us Americans take time out to celebrate the passionate, sometimes unrequited, but always deep love for the automobile. Where the 4th of July has firecrackers, Labor Day has speeches, Memorial Day has the Indy 500. These exquisite vehicles you're going to see today are the far edge of an exotic technology an exotic technology that's gone to exotic costs. And it's a technology that has some people worried that perhaps we're taking the sport out of this event, as personified by the driver. Well, not quite. Not as long as we have men like A.J. Foyt to remind us that it's always been men who have designed and men who have driven these magnificent machines since way back in 1911. And as long as they keep saying, gentlemen, start your motors, it will always be America's Memorial Day. Thank you, Jack. The Indianapolis 500 is not only the greatest race in the world, but it may in fact be the world's largest party. Let's look at yet another view of this American tradition, the sights and sounds of the Indy 500. People to take all their race. vacation, spend yeah, their right entire now, month uh, of May here. That's not on my mind. The Beijing Beijing point. We have a good race. A bad ready race to move out. Race. He's still back we'll talk about that. away from his yeah. team. How you there he is, race fans. How are you feeling, AJ? Come on, AJ. 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 Come on, 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 in this starting field that were not even born when A.J. Foyt began driving. Do they love A.J. Foyt? He walks with a bit of a limp. After seeing those x-rays, x -rays, it's surprising he walks at all. Hey, Wait, come on, give him some room. 
AJ's loyalty that in all of his years in racing, he's had only six different sponsors. He sticks with people, they stick with him. Is this indeed the last time around for AJ Foyt? What must be going through this man's mind? Nice, AJ. He said he'll retire this year. Perhaps not. Only AJ knows. That's a good song. <laughs> Paul, some athletes define what is great about their sport to people who rarely follow the sport. Arnold Palmer, Babe Ruth, Rocky Marciano, and AJ Ford. Strikes up on the banks of the Wabash as AJ comes out. Yeah. Now AJ is by that famous number 14. Chevrolet powered low that he will race in today's running the 500. And the challenge that AJ and the 33 face, well, it's the same. It remains unchanged since the track was first built back in 1909. Mario and Michael sit waiting in the pits. The start, of course, delayed, but uh, it will be coming very shortly now. Three reporters will be covering this race for us from the pits. On the track, Florence Henderson renders America the Beautiful. Emerson Fittipaldi, his wife Teresa, the winner two years ago. Of course, these are vast pits on the inside of the main straightaway at Indianapolis. We use three reporters to cover them Gary Gerald, Jerry Punch, and Jack Aroot. Let's meet them now. Paul, engine reliability always a major concern in this race. Even for the Chevrolet, the dominant power plant, the undisputed champion of today's IndyCar racing. Because of some engine failures by several Chevy teams and problems they've had this month, there's concern that the Chevy, the champion, may be vulnerable. Jerry? Well, Gary, the contender is this V6 American-made stock block Buick, which boasts the quickest qualifying laps of the month here. Now, by virtue of 10 inches of extra boost allowed only in this race, the Buick engineers feel they have the reliability problem solved. There are 10 drivers in today's field who hope they're right. Jack? 
Another story we'll be watching, tires. Remember in last year's race, many of the front runners encountering severe blistering problems due to high speeds and intense heat. Well, Goodyear went to work. They've brought a tire here that's less heat sensitive. But teams report only getting 35 to 40 laps. So that means they'll be changing all four tires on each and every stop. Well, you can count that those will be three very busy men during the running of the 500 as they cover from the pits. And they have begun now to roll the cars out to the racetrack. There's AJ's car. And they will put them in position on the main straightaway in their 11 rows of three. The crews already beginning to huddle around many of them, making those final checks. The defending champion's car, that's Ari Leyendijk's number one machine. Number one, of course, signifying his win here last year. There's Rick Mears, the pole sitter, his wife, Chris. The designer of his car, Nigel Bennett, stands just behind. I wonder what goes through a designer's mind at a moment like this, wondering what piece in that car, as we've seen with the turbine cars, it could be the smallest, the most inexpensive, that might make the difference. I'm sure that Nigel wonders what possibly could go wrong here today. What hasn't been tested? Rick Mears' car on the pole, and the field beginning to take some formation out on the main straightaway. The skies are still heavy with cloud but there is no rain immediately and of course this 11 rows of three will be led down to the green flag by the traditional pace car this year is a bit unconventional a very special car a Dodge Viper here is Jack Aroot with the story for only the second time in Indianapolis 500 history a prototype vehicle will be pacing the field now, in 1941, it was a Chrysler Newport Phaeton. In 1991, it's a Dodge Viper, a one-of-a-kind automobile that will eventually see full production by 1992. Now, the Viper is equipped with a V10 engine that puts out over 400 horsepower. And one point to remember is it already meets all of USAC's stringent performance requirements, such as being able to go zero to 90 in less than a quarter of a mile, special high-performance brakes. Well, it'll all come standard on the Viper, even when it becomes its production counterpart. Now, as you look at the Viper, if it looks reminiscent of the Cobra, there's a major reason why. One of the key men in the design scheme and production of the Dodge Viper is Carroll Shelby, the father of the Cobra. Carroll, is this a signal that we're returning in America to the high-performance muscle car era? I think so. I think that was a great era of, of the automobile. I think this has a lot of nostalgia in it of the, of the 60s, and yet it has a lot of the technology of the 90s. So it's kind of a blend. Now, when you get behind the wheel and pace the Indianapolis 500, it has another historic significance. You'll be, you didn't even expect to be here this year. This time last year, I was laying with 15% of a heart, waiting for a transplant. I didn't, think I'd be, uh, I didn't think I'd be alive this time, much less driving the pace car. I thought I'd never see another Indianapolis race, so I'm a very lucky man. Well, Carroll Shelby becomes the first man in history to pace the Indianapolis 500 with a heart transplant. The crowd continues to wait for the start of the race. ABC Sports coverage of the 75th Indianapolis 500 will return after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Race driver, Actor Paul Newman, of a co-owner in the Newman Haas Racing Team. Their drivers, Mario and Michael Andretti. And Paul heads out towards the car. Four drivers from the same family. It's a first at Indianapolis. Here's Sam Posey. Andretti and Company. Capital assets, four racing drivers. Annual earnings, well into the millions. Nature of the business, very high risk, very high reward, glory, and making your mark on history. Indy 500 history. The family patriarch Mario won the race in 1969, making the name Andretti synonymous with speed. But within months of this scene in Victory Circle, the family would take a terrible loss. Aldo Andretti, Mario's twin brother, in a sprint car crash, broke virtually every bone in his face. Mario went to see him. I was prepared for the worst, and I saw the worst. <laughs> Not shocking, of course. And when it's they're one of your own, your own blood, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's sometimes devastating, really. 
Over the years, a second generation has joined the firm. Mario's son, Michael, wanted to race even as a kid. His brother, Jeff, took longer to decide and runs Indy for the first time this year. Aldo's son, John, perhaps closer to racing risks than his cousins, earned a degree in business administration first. All three made the decision to race by themselves. We're all going into this thing with our eyes wide open, and uh, uh, you must understand it's something that, uh, from my standpoint, I didn't present this to the kids, or I didn't even suggest that this is what they should do. Uh, they've been exposed to it. It's their choice entirely. It would be highly hypocritical, obviously, if I wouldn't support them. Sport has been my life. The Andrettis love to compete against each other, like here in Portland, when Mario beat Michael. Do you want to say anything to your dad right now on national television? Well, happy Father's Day, Dad. The Andrettis have had good days, many of them, but they've also had terrible days, like this one in Pocono. John caught in a savage accident, his car ripped apart. His dad, Aldo, standing by. The scene, a reminder that if your name is Andretti, your business can be very frightening. I'm not gonna dwell on that, no. I mean, uh, just the same as someone, you know, sitting in a corner, oh my gosh, someday I'm gonna die. How I'm gonna deal with that, you know? Somebody around you's gonna die. I mean, you, you just can't do that in life, you know? In life, uh, uh, as I say, you just, uh, you analyze certain things and, uh, and certain things uh, conceivably have a price, and you say, okay, I'm willing to, to take the risk. Mario Andretti, the patriarch, that great racing family. Of course, uh, that's not the only family here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That's little Al Unser. He is the sole representative of the Unser clan in the field here today, and Gary Gerald is close by. Indeed we are, Paul. Al is on the wall here, patiently waiting. Shelly is alongside, and just a few feet away to his right is his dad. It's got to seem a little strange that Big Al's not in this race today. Yeah, it is. It's very strange to see Dad in civilian clothes and not in a driving suit. But, uh, you know, we, we knew this day was coming. It's just a shame that it happened so soon. Unlike a year ago, so much of the spotlight because of the 89 finish was on you in 1990. This year it's been a fairly quiet month for your team. And with Foyt and Andretti and uh, Mears in the front row, it's been a little quieter. Have you enjoyed that? Oh, a little bit, yes. It's something that uh, uh, the month can wear on you and, and all the pressures and so on. And this year it's been a lot more quieter than it was last year for sure. And uh, Vaveline cars ready to go. All right, well, we're going to see if we can swing over here and maybe just get a quick word with Big Al. We'll turn this way, but this has got to be so tough for you, and I don't know how you handle it, not being in this race, Al. Well, it makes it difficult, but, you know, it's a choice that if you, you know, by, like I've said, if you're not competitive, there's no use doing it. Uh, so uh, it's hard. <laughs> Will we see you in this race in the future? Oh, I hope so. No, I plan on coming back. No, I'm not through yet. You can't get rid of me yet. We're glad of that. Paul? Al Unser, four-time winner. But it's an international event. There's Hiro Mashusta, the first Japanese in the 500-mile race field. He is very happy about that. The Purdue All-American Band is assembled on the grass strip between the pit area and the main straightaway. The cars are in their 11 rows of three. Silent at this moment, the Dodge Viper pace car sits just ahead of the field. The officials are now all in place. Tom Stewart, Tom Binford, the chief steward, from the United States Auto Club. As the moments count down, each and every crew reviewing within their minds the uh, preparations that they have made and the strategies that they face. The traditional ceremonies are among the most emotional in sports. We now begin the traditions that lead to the 75th running of the Indy 500. Next, with a special salute, on this Memorial Day to our troops who fought so valiantly in the Persian Gulf. Please join Indiana's own Sandy Patty for our national anthem. Dawn's 
early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the Attention on the track. Drivers, to your machines. For the invocation, once again given by the Most Reverend Edward T. O'Meara, Archbishop of the Catholic Archdiocese of Indianapolis. For the 75th time, throngs of people are gathered here in Mid-America for what we firmly regard as the race. It is race weekend once again, but also for all Americans, Memorial Weekend. Above all else, it is God's weekend, as conscience in freedom dictates to each of us, we offer to you, O God and Lord of all, our homage, our thanks, and our praise. There will be no larger gathering of members of the human family for recreation anywhere on this earth these 12 months. In solidarity with our sisters and brothers everywhere, we proclaim our thanks for what you, O oh God, have made us and make our own both the pains and the joys of all humankind. On Memorial Weekend, we remember that we were this year a nation at war, now become a nation of peace once again. Good God, bless this peace as you alone can and make it grow both in nations and peoples. We give you great thanks that so very many of our fellow Americans and allies too have returned safely to their homelands and to the normalcy of their lives. We pledge to them our ongoing gratitude. In agony of soul, we mourn those who have not come back, and we acknowledge our need to hold these men and women in perpetual remembrance, as well as all who have ever died in the service of our country. We pray for our hostages still held in such cruel captivity, for all refugees, for those living under tyranny, for those made poor by famine and calamity. Because it's the day of the race, bless this speedway and our 33 courageous and skillful drivers, their mechanics and their crews. As they press to the edge of endurance, keep them safe from harm. Finally, bless our being together this day and return us safely to our homes, our work, and our lives. And please, too, dear Lord, some sunshine and good weather. Amen. 
Again, drivers in your machines, drivers in your machines, and also clear the track in the front two rows. All of those not associated with the race car move behind the yellow lines as the pre-race ceremonies continue. With a salute again to this great nation, here's Jim Phillippe. Would you please remain standing? On this Memorial Day weekend, we pause here in a moment of silence to pay homage to those individuals who have given their lives unselfishly and unafraid to make it possible for us to witness as free men the world's greatest sporting event. We also pay homage to those men who have given their lives unselfishly and without fear to make racing the world's most spectacular spectator sport. Scheduled A-10s performing a flyby. Here they are from the 45th Tactical Fighter Squadron, assigned to the 930th Tactical Fighter Group, USAF Reserves at Grissom Air Force Base, Indiana. This diamond formation is led by Colonel Kurt Gerton, the squadron commander. The other pilots are Major Dale Inman, Lieutenant Parker Pennings, and in the slot, Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Worth. The A-10, affectionately known as the Warthog, was designed as a tank killer and has become a combat-proven performer in the Persian Gulf War. Here they are. Race fans, as you know, the Indy 500 is all about traditions. This year, with our troops returning home each and every day from the victory in the Persian Gulf, there's special meaning to the singing of Back Home Again in Indiana. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Mr. Jim Neighbors. Back home again in Indiana, and it seems that I can see the gleaming candlelight still burning bright through the sycamores for me. The new moon hay sends all its fragrance through the fields I used to roam. When I dream about the white on the
We now direct our attention to the head of the starting field as we await the time for those magic words. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at that time of the day for the command that will start the 75th running of this event. Here to give the traditional four words is Chairman Emeritus of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Board, Mrs. Mary Fendrick Hallman. Get your, get your arm, get your leg over this way. Which way? I can't. Did I say it now? Gentlemen, start your engine. Go. The roar begins to build on the main stretch. The 33 are ready. The sound forced the cheers of a crowd. 80 years ago, it was 80,000. Now, nearly half a million people to watch 33 of the finest ready to race on a Sunday afternoon in Indiana. Emerson Fittipaldi. this race, becoming the first man to earn a million dollars in doing so. A.J. Boyd begins to roll away for the 34th time. Willie T. Ribs staring into history. activity you never get tired of this moment it's pure magic in sports it's hectic it's frantic but yet if there's a quiet confidence going into this 500 if there can be such a thing it may be with the Bobby Ray Hall team unheralded very quietly they've had a terrific month they have been consistently fast they have had a few motor problems remember he was second in this race a year ago he's been second in every race thus far this year he starts in the second row he and his team think this could be the day he gets his second Indy 500 win. Paul? So we'll keep an eye on Bobby Rahal, but Danny Sullivan in the number 20 car, Alfa Romeo powered, is not started, so they push the car to the end of the pit area, and they will roll it back, trying to get it started. He has three laps before the green flag to try to get it into position. Our onboard cameras, Al Unser Jr., you look over his right-hand shoulder. Back from the Viper, the Dodge pace car, looking at the front row. And the giant crowd all around the track. The USAC officials that looks back over the field. And of course at the wheel it is Carol Shelby. Very much part of the design of this machine. What a spectacular view to the front row as they present a similarly spectacular view to us. Here is what could be a factor today. The key information there is 50 percent chance of showers the team's strategies no doubt will revolve right around that and there is Gary Bettenhausen one of the big stories today here's Jack Aroot Paul 51 weeks ago Gary Bettenhausen was resting in a hospital in California with three broken ribs a separated shoulder and extensive burns Gary Bettenhausen has not driven a car since last year's Indianapolis 500 you've heard him tell us this is the best ride he's ever had he's never won this race he'd like to win it for his family can he do it today see him back there on the inside of the fifth row and A.J., the center of the front row, he searches ahead. A 
Let's go down to Jerry Punch. Well, Paul, when you consider the mutilation and near amputation of A.J. Foyt's feet occurred just eight months and three days ago, even those in the medical profession marvel how far he's come. And there are those that believe that his still swollen, very sensitive feet could pose a problem today. With the vibration of the chassis, they will elicit pain, pain that he has felt all month long. But with prolonged immobilization, numbness could set in. But A.J. has a solution. He'll simply bang his feet against the pedals. Yes, the pain will come back, but so will the feeling. Paul? A.J. Foyt with a long battle ahead. Now, on the line here today for Foyt and the 32 others, 200 laps around the two-and-a-half-mile track, 500 miles. This Valvoline race analysis, the average speed of record set last year by Ari Leyendijk, 185.9 miles an hour. The field here, the fastest in history at 218 and a half miles an hour. We'll have plenty of Valvoline statistics for you throughout the running of the 500 miles. Danny Sullivan's crew, Patrick racing team, they work on his car, trying to get that engine to fire. One of those already running, of course, is Rick Mears, the pole sitter. You look ahead to the Viper pace car from the inside of the front row. Here's Gary Gerald. All seven times Team Penske at Indianapolis has gone from a spot here on pit road to victory lane. And they've got two great contenders, of course, in Mears and Fittipaldi today. Mears setting the pace out there now from the pole after a violent crash the day before qualifying. His crew worried about those mechanical unexpected failures. Could it happen again? As for Fittipaldi, he's starting in row five. The concern of his crew, how many risks will he take from row five getting through traffic to battle for the lead? Knowing Emma, it could be very exciting. Paul? The engines in this race dominated by Chevrolet, but it will be a fight throughout the day between the Chevys and the Buicks. Cosworth, Judd, Alfa Romeo, the one Alfa Romeo with its trouble already. On board with Michael Andretti as he maneuvers into his starting position. And chassis in the race, well dominated, of course, by Lola. The true two sports entries are both made right here in the United States and the Penske cars, of course. back from Ari Leyendijk's car as the defending champion moves around this field. They've completed the second of two warm-up laps and now are beginning the pace lap. Let's take a look at the starting field. The pole sitter for six times, Rick Mears, then A.J. Foyt, Mario Andretti, Bobby Rahal, Michael Andretti, and Al Enzer Jr. in the second row. John Andretti, Jim Crawford, 85 winner, Danny Sullivan, the fifth row. Made up of Gary Bettenhausen, Ari Leyendijk, Emerson Fittipaldi, the fastest row in the field. Kogan, Fox, and the fastest rookie, Mike Groff. The seventh row, Scott Brayton, Tony Bettenhausen, and Bernard Jourdain of Mexico. In the eighth row, Jeff Brabham, Buddy Lazier, Hiro Mashusta, the first Japanese, John Paul Jr., Finland's Terrell Palmroth, and Scott Pruitt. The tenth row, Roberto Guerrero, Willie T. Ribs, and Dominic Dobson. And in the final row, Randy Lewis, Pancho Carter, and Gordon Johncock. pit area they begin to slide the cover back on Danny Sullivan's car as the field approaches turn three on the pace lap. And Indianapolis tradition tends to rule the field should go green at the conclusion of this lap and Danny Sullivan will start the race rolling from the pits. Michael Andretti as the pace picks up they're off in the fourth turn. The full center Rick Mears brings the field down. Carroll Shelby has the Viper off of the course. since he's won in 1988. And here is 
Gary Bettenhausen rolling for the pits already. First report is, is that Buddy Lazier is involved in that accident. And as information filters to us, we'll pass it to you. In the pits, Bobby, just a change of tires, a matter of safety, maybe ran over some debris. Well, he very easily could have, but of course, uh, it could be Buddy Lazier's accident could cause him to lock him up just for a minute, too, Paul. They did make a handling change to the front end. Let's go to Jack Aroot. Hey, hey. Gary Bettenhausen came in, took on four new tires, and he's back out on pit road, Paul. He was involved in an altercation with Buddy Lazier, but he looks as if he's going to be all right. You're looking at Buddy Lazier's car. The nose has been taken off, and the crew is trying to decide now what they can do about it. Buddy, just 23 years old, lives in Vail, Colorado. All right, here is a shot of that situation. As the field came through, there is Rick. And you saw Gary Bettenhausen lose it to the inside. Lazier caught the wall with a nose and was able to continue on. So Gary Bettenhausen, Bobby, looked like he was part of that. Yes, he did. You know, from the rain washing stuff down, he was very low. Let's look at it right here. Gary's very low, completely below the white line. What happens? He's in the turn. The water from all the rain has washed all the debris down there, made it extremely slippery. Now, Gary really should have known that. He's been here enough years for that, Paul. And so the changing surface already affecting the Indianapolis 500. Gary Bettenhausen spins first. And then to avoid Gary, Buddy Lazier decided to throw his car sideways as well. Gary Bettenhausen and Lazier both got their cars back under control. No effect. Look at all the paper and debris that's on the track in that area. See, Lazier did a complete spin around right there on the left. You can watch his nose hit the wall, took the nose right off. Probably going to put him out of the race because that's where the brake master cylinders are, Paul. Well, that damage to his car really shouldn't be a problem as far forward as it is, Bobby. There it is. You see the 51 car. That's Bentonhausen. You can see that Lazier, as a rookie, in turn one of his first race, is confronted with a spinning car right in front of him. Tough assignment. The entire front end is going to be bent on Buddy's car. Uh, it's not going to be safe to run even if they attempt to. It's going to be out of alignment and everything because he had pretty hard. Well, let's get an update on Danny Sullivan's situation. Here's Jerry Punch. Well, the bad news was they did not get to make the start of the race on the, the track. The good news, they found the problem. It was a drive cable that goes to the fuel pump that they have repaired here in the Pat Patrick team. I spoke to Pat Patrick. They have it repaired, and Danny will be able to race now, but unfortunately, he's lost some time. Paul? Uh, but this yellow will really help. At least they're not rolling laps away at high speed while we're under yellow here at the start of the Indianapolis 500. At Indianapolis, the green flag is out as racing resumes, and Rick Mears leads Mario Andretti. But Mario comes to the inside to challenge Mears. That's Michael lined up in third place just behind Mario. Kevin Kogan, in the short time that we were green, jumped from 16th to 9th place. Lately on Oval Courses, Rick Mears has had a pattern. He started from the pole. He's had six poles and almost in the last two years, and then fallen back. However, today, it looks very different. I think the pitch team and Mir very hungry for this race. Well, Sam, everybody's kind of laughed about this. Always falling back at the beginning of the races, never trying to lead the first lap. I think he's out to prove a point right now. But remember, he is one of the smartest oval drivers that there is. He may slack off a little bit more later on. Rick Mears continues to run in front. Mario Andretti and Michael Andretti challenge Rick. My line back in fourth place is AJ as the field, for the most part, has sprung out that owing to the fact of the accident early on. Now, remember, Danny Sullivan is out and running, and because of this yellow, he was able to join the race on the leader lap. So everyone runs with the leader, Rick Beer. Right now, you can see that, like with Mario there, that he's using a lot of track. He's going way underneath the white line. And Willie T. Ribs comes in to the pits. Some sort and of mechanical problem. Doesn't look good when they go to the Zeus Fastings on that calling. They're going to take the top of the car off. And usually the first thing they do is change the electronics on the car because it's easy to change, and it often is the problem. So they change it as a matter of course. Right Teammate now. stool here, Little Al and Bobby Rahal. Right now you notice all the guys are running clear down to the grass. Well, it's a little early to be doing that. It's because without, after all the rain, they're not exactly sure how the track's going to be. It's going to 
take a little getting used to for a while. Ray Hall, you, who you see there in the center of the screen in the blue and white car, has, of course, finished second in every race so far this year, and he had five seconds last year, including a second here at the Indianapolis Speedway. Ballinger Jr. being chased by his teammate, Bobby Ray Hall. Ray Hall has had a very quiet, efficient month of May. Three times this year, in the only three races leading up to Indianapolis, Ray Hall has finished in second place. Ballinger Jr. touches above 220 miles an hour. You know, it's possible, Paul, that with this strong south wind, they're going to be hitting 230 there as we see him go down the end of the back straight. But Sam, if the wind's got to blow, which it certainly is blowing right now, and there's no rain, that's good. And it's going in the right direction. In Indianapolis, the blows that blows from one end to the other end is pretty nice. It's when it blows across the track that's really messing the driver up a lot. Exactly. The effect that Rick Mears described to us before the race began was that the car would understeer a little bit as they went into turn three. So far, that has not caused anybody any trouble. We continue to watch this fight for fifth place. A.J. Boyd sits just ahead as Allinger Jr. holds off a charging Bobby Rahal, and Rahal's closing down. By their natural instincts, by the drivers being smart, and especially after Gary Bettenhausen's and Buddy Lazare's accident early on. They're all just being careful right now. They're really feeling out a brand new green racetrack. And they're feeling out the aerodynamics or the wind buffeting from the other cars right now. Paul. Gary Bettenhausen, after that first lap spin that brought out the yellow, is in 26th place. Well, Buddy Lazare is being pushed back toward the garage area. Perhaps he is out of the race. It certainly seems so. Yes, he's definitely out of the race. You can look right at the front of his car right there and see it. pieces are missing, Paul. The master cylinders and all are gone. And already the leader, Rick Mears, begins to close on the back of the field. They just went around Randy Lewis. Rick Mears, who started racing here in 1978, had never even spun out, much less had a crash here at Indianapolis. He had the first one this year, broke a long string. Of course, he came immediately back from that accident and set the car on the pole. Now A.J. Foyt being pursued by Al Unser Jr. They both come past Randy Lewis. Little Al tries to move to the inside. A.J. holds him off in turn one. He flies across the short shoot. Bobby Rahal continues pursuing Little Al. A.J. can be a little superstitious, and he remembers that he has never led the first lap of a race that he went on to win. So everybody talking so much about his leading that first lap, I'm not sure he really had his heart in it, Paul. Sam, I don't really think he did. Uh, I, I really think the point's a lot smarter than maybe people are giving credit for. He's been here like we did 34 years. Leading the first lap is not important. Not having an accident. Obviously, by looking at Gary Bettenhouse, it was important. And Al Unser Jr. closing now on A.J. Foyt. Little Al battles with him and sticks his nose ahead as they go into the corner. So Little Al is up to fourth place. The other thing we've got to remember now, while we've had a lot of rain, things are a lot different. Most of the drivers had the car set up for a really hot, slippery racetrack, which means that they put a lot of downforce in their wings. And here is... Michael or Mario Andretti, who has just picked up the lead from Rick Mir. Mario Andretti picked up the lead. So we're seeing some tremendous action here at the start. Watching one battle for fourth, suddenly Mario is able to slide past Rick, and Rick begins to fall backward a bit. Now, is that a problem with Rick, or is that Rick setting his pace? Well, it's been kind of a normal thing. I think it's, it's Rick Mears. Leading the race this early is not important to him. As we know, historically, he will come in. Pit crew will change his car, and he'll be good again. But now Mario, Mario is a charger. He's a charger from the start. He's a charger till the end. So I would have expected this, Paul. An analysis of the qualifying time suggests that Mario's car is set in such a way it has very little more top speed than it has turn speed. He spent all month setting up for this moment when the race would begin, and he had a car that really felt stable underneath him. Obviously, he's using it to full advantage. So very early on, plenty of fights here on the course. Rick Mears now moving around the traffic. That's Terrell Pomeroff of Finland that lies just ahead, and Michael is coming up to challenge Rick. They both come out to the inside on the backstretch. Wow, so close together, and Michael 
Can he hold on down the inside? Oh, it's going to be tight. Oh. Rick holds on. You never used to see him do that, run that high through to defend himself. Incredible driving, Rick Mears. So very early in the Indianapolis 500, 13 laps complete now. We're with Michael. He darts to the inside, out into clean air. He's alongside Rick. behind him to the left and to the right. Never a blind spot for a second. Once you commit to going in the turn, especially at the speed these guys are going, you know, like 225, 230 into the turn, Paul, they can't change their weight too fast. It's incredible, isn't it, Bobby? He never flinched, though, when he ran that secondary line, that wider line, and made it work for him. These are the best. There's no question about it, Tim. Right with Rick Mears through that very wide fourth turn because there's a pit lane down to the inside. And Gary Bettenhausen has just been lapped by Mario Andretti, and he lies just ahead of Rick Mears. There's a big difference in the way the cars are set because of this rain, too, Paul. I just wanted to mention because a lot of the drivers set their cars for a lot of downforce, thinking that there was going to be a hot sun shining on the track. The track would be real, real slippery. Now, what it's going to be is it's very cool outside. There's clouds over. There's going to be no sun. The track is going to be extremely fast. Guys that are set better for straightaway speed are probably going to do better, at least at the early part of the race. There are four Andretti's in the 500. Mario leads it in second place. Is Michael Andretti as we keep an eye on AJ Foyt. John Andretti just got around AJ as John charges forward. Yeah, and these four Andretti's are hardly clones of each other. They're very different, different looking. They have very different attitudes. One thing Mario taught the boys, Bobby comes Cheever there, AJ moving Foyt. past AJ. The one thing that Mario set an example for is mental toughness. These guys are tough. In the pits, Jack Aroon keeps watching AJ Foyt. And Paul, it's not a physical problem with AJ Foyt. It's a car problem. He's radioed into his crew chief, Phil Casey. The car has a terrific push to it. He says he's having a great deal of difficulty keeping it on the track in the corners. So AJ Foyt struggling with a problem. Mario Andretti leads. He led the 1966 500 at age 26. Now he is the oldest leader of the race at age 51. And I'll tell you one thing, Mario can see the spectators from where he is, and he's told me often he gets a terrific reaction from them. They're rooting for him. It's fabulous to see Mario lead this race, and he knows the spectators are pulling for him. Willie it's T. Ribs went into the pits a bit ago. He has remained there since that time. Jerry Punch, do you have an update? Paul, the lifelong dream may be over for Willie T. Ribs. On the restart, they lost a cylinder in his Buick V6. He currently has five cylinders. The Derek Walker crew now with changing the plugs, trying to figure out what the offending cylinder is. Possibly can fix it, but it looks very doubtful. Paul? Now, for over eight and a half minutes, Willie's car has been silent in the pits. But if there's a crew that can do it, directed by Derek Walker, that team certainly can. What a terrible moment for Willie. How horrible it must be to sit there and watch the rest of the field string pass, but not this car. Eddie Cheever, who just made that brilliant pass a moment ago, is rolling very quietly down to the edge of the course. This could bring out a yellow flag if that car remains in a precarious position. Well, as long as he's still rolling, they'll keep it green, but he's just about to stop us in the big call see right now. That's awfully early. Too many cars dropping out this early. This early in the race now, 18 laps into it, Bobby. Uh, are we in? As there comes Emerson Fittipaldi past AJ, who is still struggling with that car. If they go yellow, wouldn't this be an opportune moment for a stop? Well, it really would. This would put them within the window for certain sure. In fact, I think they'd be foolish not to do it right now. And the yellow flag, in fact, does come out, slowing the field. And in doing so, it comes at a most opportune moment for the cars to come into the pit. Their uh, equipment ready for a pit stop. But Paul, remember, it came, the yellow came when they were coming off of turn four. So they've got to really complete a lap before they can come and take advantage of it. Gordon Johncock, who started 33rd, is one of the first of those to make it back into the pit area. He actually was able to anticipate the yellow on the back stretch. The leader has passed the line now and coming around ready to make their stops. Both of the Andretti's come in together. Rick Mears comes in together. In fact, most of the field will probably take advantage of this yellow and make a stop. Al Unser Jr. makes his stop. There's Michael. Mario, the leader of the race, but who will come out first? After these stops, the order will scramble. 
example. Very dangerous moment, too, because so many cars are in the pits at the same time. Kevin Kogan, who made a spectacular move to the front, also comes into the pits. So most of the key players in the field have come in under the second yellow of the day. We'll be back with more from Indianapolis. Roberto Guerrero climbs out of the car. These cars can take some incredible punishment. They are designed with so much safety in mind. That's one of the Alpha cars now, one of the two Alpha cars in the race Roberto is driving. And of course, the other one is driven by Danny Sullivan, so a star-cross day for the Alfa Romeo team. And A.J. Foy puts his hand up indicating he was in that the he's crash. Look, look at the uh, left front. The yep. wheel is not making contact with the road. Not at he's all. He's damaged that suspension. And that looks to be rather permanent damage. Yeah, in fact, I Bobby, think... can that be repaired at all? No, there's I... no repair there. That's going to be that's going to be permanent, uh, Paul. Like you said, that's probably going to put him out. Gary Bentonhouse back in under the last yellow. He made a stop for 16 seconds in and out. And A.J. is waving. waving. Is he saying goodbye? Yeah, I think it might be that. The crowd saluting one of the greatest drivers ever in the history of the sport. Is this the last moment? What a terrible way for A.J. to end an Indianapolis career when this day held so much promise. You can see it's been pretty bad because the left front tire doesn't turn off of the ground when he's going straight. So it's bad. Unless they want to do a real long repair job, it's the only way they can get him back in. Field leaves AJ behind. The crowd stands to salute the grand champion as he rolls down off the fourth turn and into the pits. For sure, the car would have to have at least an entire left front corner. That would be the least amount of damage done. There had been so much speculation before the race. Would his success in qualifying cause him to decide to come back, perhaps for a 35th year? The signal that you see him making from the cockpit right now suggests no. This is the farewell of A.J. Foyt. Now, Sam, I don't think it's bothering him all that bad. I think he's he's made this race a 34th start. You can see Foyt is never this happy. I've never seen him drop out of a race and been happy before. He's the oldest man ever to run this race, 56-year-old A.J. Foyt. the pits on the 25th lap of the 75th Indianapolis 500 to a standing ovation. Anthony Joseph Boyd Jr. prefers to be known simply as AJ. certain that, that he's convinced, yes, he unstraps. That's the end of it, Paul. They continue to work with Kevin Kogan at that accident site after he was involved causing this yellow with Roberto Guerrero. himself looks down at the mangled parts in the left front. No doubt wondering, is there a part, is there something I can do? But I'm sure there's not. Well, you know, Paul, he's the one that's going to make the decision, believe it or not. When he takes his helmet off, he'll look at it a little bit more. And if he decides to fix it, believe me, the guys will start working. It began with a spin in 1958. It ends after a crash in the pit area as A.J. Foyt climbs out for the last time. The car now starts its lonely trip back to the garage area in Gasoline Alley. You see that little rod sticking up there? You can see that's part of the steering pole. 
Now A.J. out of the car is with Jack and Root. Well, A.J. Foyt, the car is battered and bruised, but you've come back here and you waved to the crowd as you went around. Was that a special moment for you? Were you saying goodbye? Well, I don't know. I was very sad. I thought we'd do good, but we had something malfunction in the pitch or we wouldn't have been back there. We was kind of playing it cool. We tried for the lead and didn't get the lead at first, so we just wanted to run the race where we had it planned. And Everything was going good till we had our pit stop. I don't know what happened. Well, that was an air wrench that malfunctioned on the left front of the car, and they were working on it, but you maintained your composure and you went back out. What are your thoughts right now when you see this, the possibility? Is it the end for you? I don't really know what I'm going to do. Uh, it's, everything's going through my mind right now. When you had a chance back in 1961 to talk to Ray Haroon, you asked him, when did you know that it was time to quit because he quit when he was in his mid-30s? He said it had come to you. Has it come to you? Well, not really. But I make a statement or commitment. I usually try to live with it. Paul, he wants to keep the option open. And I'm sure were he to commit to retirement, the fans would not hold him to that promise. Willie T. Ribs out of the race as well. Here's Jerry Punch. Well, Paul, ironic. Two of the men who got the biggest applause when they qualified were A.J. Foyt and Willie T. Ribs, and both of them have climbed out of their cars here almost simultaneously. Willie, what happened? Well, Jerry, right after the green flag started, the car was fine, and then we had a yellow, and then when we restarted again, we developed a misfire, and we can't detect it, and it's just dropped the engine right off. So, you know, it's, you know, it was a great month, and I thank McDonald's, and I thank all the support and all the fans and everybody that's motivate me to get here, and I'm just sorry that uh, we didn't get to run the whole race. Will you be back next year? Absolutely. I think that, you know, we, we want to be back, and I know the fans want me back, and I support, and I thank you all. A lot of courage, a man who may be beginning a long career at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Willie T. Ribs. Let's go up pit road to Gary Gerald. Well, Jerry, while A.J. Foyt was limping toward his pit in his car, the defending champion, Ari Leyendijk, was in his pit. And the chances now of repeating a 500 championship have certainly been dimmed. Some type of electrical problem took off the bodywork. They changed spark plugs. They've been trying to make adjustments. They've got him back on the track, but he was in here, unfortunately, a very long time. Paul? Yeah, but the good news, Gary Gerald, is that that lengthy pit stop didn't bother him that much. He came back in in 19th place, only a lap behind the leaders. We are still under yellow. The reason for the yellow, of course, is an accident that involved A.J. Foyt, Roberto Guerrero, and Kevin Cogan, who is now out of the car. But you can see the USAC safety crews and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway safety be very careful with Kevin. And we'll uh, keep a close track of this situation with Kevin Cogan. Look in the upper right-hand corner here as we look back toward the situation that set up this yellow. Both cars hard into the wall long before they were into the corner, corner, Bobby. Well, they certainly did, and of course, we didn't see it soon enough right there in that shot to be able to make a call on it, why it happened. But, boy, I'll guarantee you, they both hit the wall hard, and obviously, from all the damage, we could see that anyway. But there's Kogan behind. And, you know, the, the new cars... You know, you can see... Cars dodging everywhere. Ricardo Guerrero in the foreground. Yeah, look Kevin at, Kogan in the upper part of the screen. Yeah, Kogan, uh, Kogan, you know, something might have gotten into the cockpit. Uh, the car didn't look like it was bent up super, super bad, so probably one of the rods came through or something. Well, well maybe that last replay will give us the most information on what happened to Kevin Kogan. Kevin and the Kogan, others. We'll take a look at it again. Palos Verdes, California. There it is. Now let's look at the cars that are running just behind. Imagine the uh, guys trying to dodge all the tires. And A.J. was caught by debris. He actually had the car well down under control. Take a look now. All right, now watch A.J. Foyt's car. It's the black car on the inside. And Sam, a piece of debris right there. And see that debris bouncing in front of A.J.'s car? That debris is a tire. Oh, he hit a tire and hit it hard, Paul. It's almost too small, Bobby, to be a tire. It looks like another part of the wheel assembly, perhaps the brake caliper or something. Whatever it was, it was heavy, and it did incredible damage to the front end of A.J.'s car. Kevin Hogan caught the wall on both sides of the car. He is now in the ambulance and going back to the Hanna Emergency Medical Center here at the track. One more look. 
Both cars hard against the outside wall at a most unusual place. I've not seen an accident in that area of the track in a very long time. They ride the wall and then they come off the wall with the rest of the field coming down. And you know what Bobby said about it seemed as if Kevin might have been hit in the head. He didn't seem to be sitting forward in the cockpit as he crossed the track. They cheer A.J. Foyt as he leaves the track. ABC Sports coverage of the 75th Indianapolis 500 will return after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Back at the Indianapolis 500, which was delayed because of rain, the caution flag is out at the moment, but we expect to go green any time, and we'll do so with Mario Andretti leading his son to the line as the green comes out. Now, we've already had a series of incidents in this race on the very first lap. We had a spin from Gary Bettenhausen and look at the battle for the lead as Mario and Michael fight it out. And Mario, takes, Mario gives way to his son. Michael has the lead of the race. Bettenhausen spun that set buddy Lazier into the wall. Lazier is out of the race. Bettenhausen replaced tires and is back in the action. There are four Andretti's in the top ten right now. John runs six, Jeff runs ten. I still think it's amazing to see a father and son race so close and so hard against each other like that. As I said before, they don't cut each other any slack. We had a caution then for Eddie Cheever, who was already out of the race with a problem. And Rick Mears began sliding backwards from his pole position. Then the yellow flashed on again as Roberto Guerrero and Kevin Cogan got together on the north shoot. And as they ricocheted off the wall, debris plummeted down and hit the left front of A.J. Foyt's car. And A.J. Foyt is out of the race. This race is only 34 laps old. We're approaching the first 100 mile mark. Now you can see Rick Mears working on a little L right now. Now, Jack Arun tells us that he made an adjustment to the rear end of the car when he came in for his pit stop, like we thought he would. Probably put a bigger wicker bill on the back of the wing, Paul. Now you can see him start working a little out, so his car is definitely gained. And whatever they did has obviously helped Rick as he comes up inside a little L. I think but Rick look, is. Look at how he came off that corner, though, Bobby. Seem to push coming off the corner. Let's keep an eye on Rick Mears. He's definitely pushing, Paul. There's no question about it. That means the adjustment that he made to us too much, because there comes Ray Hall by him now. Ray Hall gets him on the inside. So Ray Hall saw whatever it was with Rick. Now Rick's going to come right back at Ray Hall. No, he isn't. Look at the desperate trouble he's in, Paul. When he goes down that low, look at him down. He will be almost on the grass when we get around to turn one. That's turn four there. That means he's got a real bad pushing condition. That's the line you see him take with the front end just will not bite as you go through the turn. He's in a lot of trouble. He's going to lose a lot of ground in the next few laps. Look at him down onto the, almost onto the grass. Using a tremendous amount of the course. We're accustomed to seeing Rick Mears drive with precision. That's not what we're seeing now. He is obviously struggling with that car. Now all he can do now is slow down in the turn because with the front end pushing like that, he would just soon hit the wall or wear out the right front tire. So he just got to slack off. He can't come in now. It's too early to come in after the last stop. He'll have to put some laps on, hope for another yellow, or run out as approximately 33 to 35 laps of green before he can get involved. Remember the last time Rick won this thing, he fell a full lap behind and was able to make it up. He knows how to save the car. Rick down inside. We keep watching. Certainly not the driving style that we're accustomed to out of Rick, but for the moment at least it appears that he's comfortable with it. But still, it's put him back in fifth place. Just ahead of him is Bobby Rahal. Jack Roo, do you have an update on Rick? Well, I think we're seeing a brand new line for Rick Mears because he reports to Richard Buck's crew chief that everything's fine. They seem very, very pleased with the car right now. Right, Richard, what do you think? I have to say that's wrong. I think that they just don't want to talk right now. Rick Mears is going backwards and getting past. There's something wrong with him, I promise you. All right, Lion Dyke, we've mentioned, has been in and out of the pit several times. We have an update. Here's Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, they were able to locate the problem. It was a broken spark plug. They replaced them, as you mentioned. It was under the luxury of the yellow, so they lost just one lap, but they feel the problem is corrected. He's back at speed, on course, well back in the middle of the pack. All right, Lion Dyke running back in 14th place, but in the last few laps, he's been able to move up. He came back off that stop in 19th position. 
There's Emerson Fittipaldi working with John Andretti right now, working up another good race right there, Paul. There's number five, Emerson Fittipaldi. Somebody that we, we expected to be a lot faster early on in the race. That's the battle for six, of course, Bobby, and Rick Mears, who's running fifth, is right ahead of them. You can, if you look just up the road there, there's Rick Mears. There he comes. Then John Andretti, and then Emerson Fittipaldi. That John Andretti is working up on Mears, pulling up on him, so back again, Rick is definitely in some sort of a handling problem. Fittipaldi comes up behind Andretti. Emmo has led 286 laps during the past two years as he works his way to the front. He drives a line not dissimilar from that being run by Rick, don't you think, Bobby? Well, he's, he's uh, keeping up uh, a similar line, but Paul, they're all going down to the bottom and all coming out. Remember, Rick Mears just had to slow down to retain that line. Several years ago, the rule here was that you couldn't drive with four wheels below that line. That is no longer the case. No, they had to give up on that to manage, but did at least temporarily until they could do something else about the track, Paul, because when it's easy to run down there, the guys are just going to do it, and that's human nature. And talk about the Andretti family. Well, they dominate the top ten. Michael is first, Mario is second. They also occupy sixth place with John and tenth with Jeff. Emerson Fittipaldi just went by John Andretti. John's run into some handling problems. Watch him slowing down the turns a little bit there, too, Paul. Most people, most of the drivers stay at the Speedway Motel on the grounds. Emerson Fittipaldi on the right of the screen here now pursuing Rick Mears. Here There's comes Ray Hall challenging his teammate, Little Al. So two battles between teams right now, Paul. And I'm sure neither owner really entirely happy with it. As we're just crossing the 100-mile mark, you don't want to see your team battling itself this early on. No, well, that's but... for sure, Paul, because, you know, there's nothing worse than for a team owner to have his car get into an accident together. And I'm not saying it would happen, but it could. It's never a good feeling. You watch Bobby Rahal. The numbers on the center of his steering wheel tell him when his flow gauge on the dash reaches those numbers that it's time to come into the pits for refueling. Bobby Rahal sticks his nose right up behind Little Al. Watch right the, in the turn itself. Bobby Rahal will not follow directly behind Little Al because if he does, the turbulent air will cut the air off that he needs to get uh, the grip he needs on the track. That's and run just slightly to one side of it. That's Tony Bettenhausen that they work down underneath. Well, what you can see there would be a little bit contrary to what Sam said. It's that how important that the drafting, the slip streaming is here. Watch Ray Hall right there, and he has to use the slipstream. Little Al would use the car ahead to try to keep Ray Hall from passing because he needed that slipstream to stay ahead. With everything around here, right up behind him, there's the momentum. And right behind does it, he doesn't have an advantage on you. 43 laps into the record book. Michael Andretti leads. His father, Mario, runs in second place. Al Unser Jr. is third. Bobby Ray Hall. There comes Rick Mears by and fifth. In sixth place, it's Emerson Fittipaldi. The Indianapolis 500 now begins to settle down just a bit. The 75th running. Chaotic at first. With the yellow flag right on the very first lap. So out in front, it's the Andretti family. And that seems to have become the story, at least for the moment. The run continues, though. There's still over 400 miles to go. Bobby Rahal and his teammate Al Unser Jr. have been dicing it up for third place. That fight continues. There's plenty of sports this afternoon here on ABC Sports, and it's auto racing. The international race of champions. Scott Pruitt, Rusty Wallace, Bill Elliott are in the lead as they head into the second challenge of the IROC, and that comes up right after the Indianapolis 500 here on ABC. Spreading through traffic now. There is Ray Hall fighting with Little Al, and Ray Hall brings it down low, trying to take advantage of that car that may, in fact, block his teammate, and that is Jeff Andretti just ahead of him. Boy, that, that's racing in the short shoot, Paul. That's kind of rare, especially for two cars and running as fast as these two are, but what happened was Ray Hall was able to grab a little bit, get a run of Little Al. Little Al got caught up in traffic. Now, that's the easiest way that there is to pass here at the Speedway that the guys always look for the most. In the meantime, Michael Andretti stretched his lead to over seven and a half seconds over his father. You're on board with Bobby Rahal as he comes alongside of Jeff Andretti. Waves thank you for the recognition that he was there and giving him a clean shot. 
Jim Crawford's car has been retired as a crew member puts a, one of puts a helmet away. And Jim Crawford's day is done. Driving here for Kenny Bernstein. There's a lot of courtesy. You saw Ray Hall's little wave there to Jeff Andretti. A lot of courtesy between the drivers out there on the track. They really owe their lives to each other. Another great story here is Scott Brayton has a strong run going. He's managed to move up into seventh place. Now let's get an update from the emergency medical center. Here's Jerry Punch. Dr. Henry Bach has come out of the medical center. Uh, Henry, what's the status on uh, Roberto Guerrero and Kevin Kogan? Roberto Guerrero has uh, suffered a small bruise to his right shoulder, and he will be released from the hospital here shortly. Um, Kevin Kogan is complaining of some right arm pain and some right leg pain. However, he remains awake and alert. That is very good news. Kevin Kogan makes a trip to the hospital, but that's a much better report than we may have expected considering the length of time it took to get him out of the car. Here comes Bobby, Bobby. Rahal alongside of Emerson. Fittipaldi, Rahal runs a high line here. Fittipaldi keeps down low and then dials off the low side of the corner. So Fittipaldi is able to keep Rahal back in an ongoing fight for fourth place. There's a, there's a deal where Fittipaldi had about four cars making a draft for him. Boy, he was just like a vacuum cleaner. It just sucked him right on by it. Ray Hall, of course, got caught in the traffic, slowed down. That was it for him. As Sports Illustrated Sam Bowles once wrote, Ray Hall is the indie driver who just doesn't look like one. He's bald and he wears glasses. He bites his nails. He used to chain smoke. Managed to give that up. You see him there on the right of the screen with the aid of a hypnotist. He's a 38-year-old who really could be 50, except for the way he performs in a racing car. I tell you what, he's been in a lot better shape more recently, though. He has stopped smoking. He really seems to have settled his life, gaining confidence from his two championships and his Indy win in 1986. Now, as we mentioned earlier, he cycles every day. Fittipaldi comes past Jeff Brabham in the second of the true sports entries. And approaches. Tony Bettenhausen and comes down inside. Ray Hall takes the low line as well and continues his pursuit. But Fittipaldi turns off into the pits. So Mario Andretti just ahead of Fittipaldi too. There's Mario heading for the pits. We're on lap 53. And Mario with what appears to be a routine stop, but it will take him out of second place. Fittipaldi. Penske crew working on that car. Who will come out first? The pit crews battle one another now. Mario has a little trouble re-engaging the clutch as he comes out. Fittipaldi is still in the pit. Oh, it's hard to get these cars going. People probably wonder sometimes why, but they only make about 135, 150 horsepower until the turbocharger is high. Let's go to Jack Aroot in the pits. We've had a problem with Emerson, Emerson Fittipaldi's uh, problem on the pit road was a left front tire. When they exchanged it, they put the wheel lug back on. The pneumatic wrench failed. They couldn't get it to tighten it properly. It cost them valuable time on pit road, and that accounted for Michael Andretti being able to make up valuable time on pit road. Well, Mario Andretti in and out. Michael Andretti just made his stop as well. So under the green flag, on the 53rd lap, the leaders all took a look at the pits, and now the Gallus Craco organization is waiting for the arrival of Al Unser Jr. and Bobby Rahal. Now, Paul, the reason a lot of them are making the stop maybe a little bit earlier than the last time they had fuel would simply be because they haven't had a chance to check their mileage under the green yet. That's little Al stopping. Bobby Rahal comes past the stop as well. All four tires, everybody's coming in now, remember. They haven't had a lot of lap, or lap under the green, and that's the only way that they can check their fuel mileage. After this stop, they'll be able to run a little bit longer. Let's go to Jack. Well, Rick Mears, now in order to make this stop, they're trying to correct a tough condition, a handling condition where the car was pushing. They said they were going to add a little bit of wind. They drop all four tires, and he is off and away. But remember, gentlemen, they went through 43 sets of tires to come up with 10 good sets for this race. Also, if you're looking and saying, wow, they look like they're way down the track, much closer to the pit exit than in past years, you're absolutely right. Remember, with accidents like Dominic Dobson's and Mark Dismore's, they have uh, moved several of the pits, in fact, three of them down south of the Gasoline Alley entrance and closer to the exit of the pits to kind of clear up the north end of the track. Alancer Jr. came out of the pits, the leader of that battle, but now 
it is Michael Andretti that after the pit crews made their stops has the lead of the race. And the Valvoline race summary after 50 laps, Mario Andretti was the leader. Started in the third position, led for 10 laps. The average speed, nothing to brag about just yet. Three caution flags have brought the average down to 164.7 miles an hour. Bobby Rahal has been involved in a rather constant fight with his teammate Allinger Jr. And under green, here is the leader of the race. Remember, for the race to be official, it must run half distance plus one lap. It's 101 laps, and the clouds continue to be incredibly thick up there. The drivers cannot be oblivious to that. They have a good view of the uh, weather rolling in from the south of the track as they head down the main straight. Well, Michael Andretti is out in front. We mentioned all the varied stories of this race, and among them have been the story of the tires. Remember last year, tires blistered. There was even some concern this week, Bobby Unser. But it doesn't seem that given the cool conditions, that's going to be a problem. Paul, I checked all these tire stories out yesterday. There is no right front tire problems on the wearing out. We heard some rumors that there might be, but there isn't. And especially with the track as cold as it is today. With no sun beating down on the surface, the tires are literally going to be heaven for all the guys today, believe me. Michael Andretti, for example, is generally so far, 56, 57 laps into that race, he's been about the best handling of the fastest car on the track. Let's go down to the pits now. Here's Gary Gerald. And Paul, Jim Crawford is on the wall on the wrong side of the racetrack. Was it electrics or what happened, Jim? Well, we're not for sure yet. We'll take it back and have a look. It lost the cylinder for some reason. So that was his hour so much hope but so many questions about the reliability of the Buick and you did a tremendous amount of testing yeah uh, what can you say a race is a race uh, things happen uh, it's a shame for the Quaker State people are all out there cheering me on well at least he didn't go to the hospital this year let's go to Dr. Jerry Punch well that's where Roberto Guerrero just walked out of Roberto it's good news that you're okay what happened up there uh, we were uh, racing together in fact we were side by side for a whole lap before that and uh, you know, I left exactly the same room that I had left in all the other corners. All of a sudden, I felt a little bump in the back, and, and that was it. I don't know if maybe his car just understeered a little bit into me or something. It was just one of those things. We were racing really well. So you got the Alpha ride here. What, what's in the future for Roberto Guerrero? Well, at the moment, uh, you know, Pat Patrick has promised me that he's going to try and do Michigan and another race, maybe Laguna Seca. Uh, so that, that's really the only hope I have at the moment. I don't really have anything anything. For sure. Roberto Guerrero fortunate to walk away from this one. Paul? Defending champion Ari Leyendijk into the pits, making his stop in and out in just under 17 seconds. Leader of the race is still Michael Andretti. And a good fight beginning to develop now between the 18 car of Bobby Rahal and the 5 car of Emerson Fittipaldi. That's Jeff Andretti just ahead of Bobby Rahal. Jeff Andretti, Paul, has really been looking good for us. New driver for a guy that hasn't gotten off a lot of He's been doing a tremendous job. Ray Hall fighting with Gary Bettenhausen, trying to catch both Gary and Jeff Andretti, and lined up just behind them, the Penske organization and the person of Emerson Fittipaldi right behind him. And then Rick. Emerson Fittipaldi arrived this morning on a motor scooter from an Indianapolis suburb where he rents a house. Boy, look at this. There's Bettenhausen leading Ray Hall. Ray Hall slides to the inside. Ray Hall tries to get Bettenhausen and can't get it. Jeff Andretti stays in the fight. Nobody's given up on this one. Watch uh, this battle now because Bettenhausen, of course, has the Buick engine, which is supposed to be so powerful, and Ray Hall has the Chevrolet. Bettenhausen wants to race him. He can turn the boost up and be very fast on the straightaway. Keep Ray Hall at bay. But he can't run the whole race that way. <clears throat> I've run out of fuel. Well, Sam, he won't turn the boost up, believe me, but what he will do is to know that the Buick probably has 100 more horsepower than that Chevrolet. Unless the Chevy gets a good run at him down that straightaway, he can't pass the boost. Bobby, uh, Gary told me yesterday that he would make boost adjustments somewhere between 52 and 55 inches. And in heavy traffic, he would go to his engine a little more like a jockey, kind of whipping his horse a little bit. Rick Mears challenging his teammate, Emerson Fittipaldi, an ongoing fight for fifth place. Bobby, the two different engines, the Buick, the Chevrolet, they make horsepower in different ways and have widely different 
ranges in terms of RPM. They certainly do, Paul, because one has an awful lot of power at low RPM, or say at 9,200, the other one goes up to 12,400, Chevrolet. So two entirely different engines battling here in Indianapolis. 62 laps of the 200 complete. Michael Andretti is still out in front. It's a lead gray sky over the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Michael Andretti leads this race, but rain could yet be a factor. Now we had hope that we could give you from time to time a complete rundown through the entire 33 cars in the field. We do that with the assistance of the computers that generate the scoring of the race over in the United States Auto Club timing and scoring section. The report is that the primary computer let go very early on in the race. And so as a result, we can't give you that rundown now. We'll try and help you with it as best we can. Ongoing battle for sixth place. Emerson Fittipaldi, Rick Mears, John Andretti. Paul, as I looked at the speed on Michael Andretti a little while ago, 215 miles an hour. That's slow for the people that don't understand. The track means, or means that the track is very slippery. They should have been running about 218 to 220 right now. I'm sure it'll clean off a little bit later. Yes, because Bobby, as we saw Michael driving from the inboard onboard camera, his car, wouldn't you judge, seems to be handling very well? Yes, it is, Tim. Michael Andretti, by the way, is just behind this. He's about four seconds back from lapping those Penske cars. Let's get an update from Jack Aru. Well, it seems as everyone is having a great deal of difficulty getting the handle, as they say, on this racetrack. They keep chasing it. In one minute, it tends to be a little loose. Then the car tends to push. Both of the Craco Gallus team cars are now reporting that they've got a slight push after they made the last series of pit stops. They just haven't been able to find the right combination yet. So they still struggle to find the track as Michael Andretti comes up behind Harry Leyendike, who is running in ninth place and gets past him. Michael was fourth at Indy three years ago. He's broken down in the last two years, but both times he was contesting the lead, and he knows how to win 500 milers as his two victories in the Michigan 500 attack. Boy, boy, you can just see how slippery it is. Michael up and turned forward. We watched him with clear down to the yellow line. Very seldom we see the cars that low. Michael Andretti, of course, with now a long history at the Indianapolis 500. He leads this race. We asked him, are you still as intense in your approach to racing as ever? I think the intensity, though, is in there. I think it's the same. Uh, you know, the only difference is the experience. You know, I feel a lot more comfortable now than I did you know, back when I started. Um, you know, I was very fortunate my first year here in 84 where I had a really good car and I felt confident the whole month, but uh, reality struck the following year in 85 when the car wasn't right and it was a very long month. And it, and that's the year that I really came to respect this place. And, uh, you know, it's those type of experiences that make you feel comfortable today because you know what you pretty much would expect. You know, and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's good. And look how Michael comes up and tries to handle his cousin John, but John doesn't want any of it. He pulled alongside on the back stretch. Now they work into three. Paul, just look how low John was running. It would make you think by looking at that that he was going to the pit today. Look at they're running so low. I don't believe in all the years I've been here, I've seen him run this low on the racetrack. So obviously, it's very slippery out there for whatever reason. You know, dropping oil, water, debris, you know, dust things like that the guys are really to the bottom rick mears comes inside gary bentonhouse and not a pass from position but mears is trying to keep away from michael andretti who is just behind and of course that's the battle of the buicks we've been talking about but how are the buicks faring well jim crawford is out willie t ribs is out kevin cogan is out with a crash gary bentonhouse is running two laps down <laughs> very very tight here at the speedway the speed differences have been a concern because the two different engines the production based Buick and the Chevrolet racing engine tends to make horsepower in a different way as Bobby told you and that means that there's a slight difference in the speed you know the big advantage to that Paul is is that more RPM the better because it's the RPM produces horsepower to the rear wheel a lot more than like the lower RPM would be to the rear wheels. It's just a simple thing of multiplication. 73 laps of the 200 are now complete. 
Michael Andretti is out in front of the Indianapolis 500, which started a little bit late. We were delayed here on the start because of a rain shower that passed early in the morning. In fact, it was raining quite steadily very early in the morning. Then on the very first lap, Gary Bentonhausen lost control. He spun. Buddy Lazier spun as well. Buddy's car was too heavily damaged to continue. Gary Bentonhausen is in the fight, but he's two laps behind the leader. Then Eddie Cheever fell out of the race. And that brought out the second caution of the day. And then Roberto Guerrero and Kevin Kogan got together. Heavy damage to both cars. Kevin Kogan has been taken over to Methodist Hospital of Indiana. They're going to have a look at some pain that he's complaining about in arms and legs. Roberto Guerrero is all right, but that accident also took out A.J. Foyt, debris from the accident hitting the left front of his car, and to a giant ovation, A.J. Foyt walked back into the garage area. So the Indianapolis 500 continues. Michael Andretti is out in front. ABC Sports coverage of the 75th Indy 500 will return after this message and a word from our ABC station. On board with Michael Andretti, the leader of the lace race, but he comes over to the left into the pit area and makes yet another pit stop. This on lap 78, and Gary Gerald waits for him. Indeed we do, Paul. We're wedged in between tires, fuel tank. I've never seen it as crowded in the pits, but now we see the nose of the car. Building hose is engaged. He reported on the radio that everything was good. We see a tremendous amount of heat being generated from the brakes and the right rear. Smoke coming there, no major problem. Still up on the jacks. Mario came in. He wanted more stagger because he had a push. Now he's down and away. We got it right around 16 seconds on the Michael and ready stop. He was happy with the way the car was working prior to this stop, Paul. Right on the money. Good work for the team. The timing is right, Gary Gerald, but not fast enough to keep Little Al from coming past in the first corner as Michael was coming back to speed, and now Al Hunter Jr. has the lead of this race. Paul, the one thing I noticed that's really strange is they're pitting awfully early on fuel. I think we're going to have to check out their fuel mileage to see if it's as bad as it looks like it is right now. Let's go to Jack Aroon. Paul, let me tell you what the teams are going to do. They're going to adjust the handling through the use of tire pressure in the right rear tire. Normally, a right rear like this would carry 45 pounds of pressure. There haven't been any tire wear problems. What they're going to do is they're going to increase by two pounds the pressure. Now, they're radial, so they can't adjust the stagger. What that's going to do is change the spring rate in the right rear and free up the car. That's what Al Jr. is going to do and Bobby Rahal in this pit stop sequence. Yeah, and they can afford to do that, Jack, I believe, because it's a relatively cool day. Last year, that was the problem. They wanted to use more pressure, and it blistered the tire. Allender Jr. completes the 80th lap, the 200th mile. He is the leader of the race. Bobby Rahal is second, then Fittipaldi, then Michael Andretti. Rick Mears runs in fifth. John Andretti is sixth. Scott Brayton is seventh. Eighth is Mario Andretti as they wait for Emerson Fittipaldi to pit. In ninth is Ari Leondyke. Tenth is Jeff Brabham. Eleventh is Gary Bentonhausen. They are now Jeff Brabham, Bentonhausen, two laps behind the lead of the race. Let's go to Jerry Punch. Scheduled pit stop for Emerson Fittipaldi. Rick Ronovan and the crew will change all four tires. The fueling will take place. And, of course, Fittipaldi running his own race. Ronovan said they were hoping to get the car a little bit quicker. They make no significant adjustment on the car. A little trouble now with the left rear. They finally get the tire back on. Off to Jackson, Fittipaldi is away. And the roar of that engine as Fittipaldi comes back to the fight and Gary Bettenhausen makes his stop, and here is the leader of the race, Al Unzer, Jr. Here's Jack. Teammates come down pit road. Al Jr. comes to a stop as the Gallus Greco teammate, Bobby Rahal, also comes in on pit, pit road. Tearing away a tearaway. Now, we told you they were going to adjust tire pressures to free both cars up. They have completed their work on Al Jr.'s car as they continue to work on Bobby Rahal's machine. And it is a drag race by these teammates down pit road. Greg Callis doing a fine job with those two cars. Little Al leads Rahal out of the pits, though. You know, that's kind of interesting, Paul, because they do all their pit stop practices together at Dallas Motor Company right in Albuquerque. So I was kind of interested to see who was going to get out first. I think we're starting to see some rain on the uh, lens of our onboard camera on Rahal's car. Well, we completed 82 laps. That is 19 short of a full race. 
clouds are very dark to the south. That can definitely figure into the race. In fact, these teams yep. will do yep. some incredible. Up, oh, Terrell Pomroth has a fire in the engine compartment. He's not in danger, but he wanted to get it stopped as quick as he could. Now they're trying to get his helmet, which is snapped. He's on a little tether to the side of the car to help keep his head up. Right. One of the, he's one of the biggest drivers, too, in the, in the race. It's hard to get him in and out of a cockpit. And we go yellow with this situation as they there's Darrow is out and free of the race car. When you're in that and you're stuck in it and you don't, in the panic of the moment, you don't know why you can't get out. You can just be terrified. Now we're approaching the halfway point of the race, the halfway point being 100 laps. That's 15 laps away now. We are under yellow because of this situation, but as suggested, the crowds overhead are getting much darker. There is the possibility of the rain. That will figure into the race as well. We'll be back. Paul Newman, co-owner with Carl Haas on the Newman Haas team. His car, Michael Andretti at the wheel, is in the lead. And just over his shoulder there, million dollar operation. They use a number 10 can to help keep the vent covered over in case of moisture. Newman, of course, has been the co-owner of this team since the early 1980s. There's Terrell Pomeroy's car being carried away. He's in good shape. We saw him wave to the crowd. Newman would desperately like to see uh, a victory today. It would confirm and, and all of the years of waiting. Paul Newman, bored with the yellow flag. <laughs> Roger Penske, he's keeping an eye on his cars. Next Saturday at 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock Central on ABC <laughs> Tour. The sport's best pair up and take aim at the $142,500 purse in the Beaumont PBA Doubles Classic Live. And then at 4.30, 3.30 Central Time on Wide World of Sports, it's the broadcast premiere of the controversial Mike Tyson and Razor Ruddock Heavyweight War. And what a war it is. Plus the Advil Mini Marathon from New York City. It all begins Saturday here on ABC Sports. Well, they cleaned the track up. Still under yellow from Terrell Pomroth's fire in the engine compartment. Let's get an update on Michael from Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, of course, he's been battling up here with the lead just as he came in for that last pit stop. He was on the radio hollering, loose, loose, loose. They made the stop. They found a puncture in the left rear. That's why the car was loose. But the critical thing is they made a slight wing adjustment on the stop. So now, how is the car going to react when they go back to green? Will they have to go back to the earlier setting on the next stop? That's the question the Michael Andretti crew has right now. Well, Michael Andretti, of course, runs at the lead. There's Terrell Pomros, number 23, sitting by the edge of the course. This is what happened. You can see some puffs of smoke coming out of the back. He, apparently something broke in there and set fire to the engine compartment. It looked to me like an oil fire, Bobby. Well, it could have been an oil fire. It could have been fuel, Paul, because once the fuel gets to burning also, it'll burn some of the materials around there. Most likely, though, it's an oil fire. Terrell himself forgot about that tether. He was so anxious to get out of that car, you can well understand that. The driver's getting his beer is naturally fired. Boy, you can just see with him. He doesn't want to negotiate this deal. He wants out of that car. If that name sounds a little unfamiliar, he's from Finland, where he worked in the shoe business that made his family so prosperous. Very nice man. But like so many others here, his dream has been to drive the Indianapolis 500. Well, as we run under yellow, you've seen so much running in traffic. We ask a series of the drivers, what is it like to drive in traffic at Indy? Traffic is uh, pretty tough because of the fact that, that the air dominates the car so much when you're running over 200 miles an hour. Uh, when you're behind another car, you're losing 15, 20 percent of your aerodynamics that you've had to hold you down on the, on the track, and that's throwing you all over the place. The car's moving around, your head's moving around. You're following just one car is one thing, when we're following a group of cars like a storm out there and it's not the eye of the storm you're on the outside i mean you're where it's tough where it's heavy when i'm driving alone and there's not many cars around me i, I think it gets a little boring and then once i get a group of five six cars in front of me then i i kind of say yeah you know i've got something to do you know, i've got something to get my way through and uh, it can be very exciting traffic but you have to think for the other guy the guy in front of you if he's slow there's a reason for that. He might have a problem and he might be so busy concentrating on the turn and trying to keep his car underneath him that he might not be paying attention to you. So you have to think for the other competitor uh, while you're trying to attack him or lap him. 
And so there is no misunderstanding. The yellow is for Taro Pomroth's fire. We had mentioned that there was a drop or two, but nothing really to affect the speedway. In fact, it's lightening up over the speedway right now. 87 laps are complete. Now, the race is official at 101 laps, just past the halfway point. So should it start to rain, you could call the race. And all of these teams are absolute experts at trying to predict the weather. There trying, it is. Not necessarily predicting the weather. Around here, Paul, everybody has to be a weatherman the way it's been this month. Matter of fact, I remember one time, and maybe he's done it today, Pat Patrick sent his airplane up to try and find where the leading edge of some of the storms are. Now, you can't do that because we're not talking storms. We're talking a general overcast, and there could be water in any of those. So the weatherman is definitely part of the Indy 500. As the green flag is ready to face the field, they come off of the fourth turn. Michael Andretti leads them down. Emerson Fittipaldi is in second place. In third place is Al Unser Jr. In fourth place, coming back to the line, Bobby Rahal. And then Mario Andretti. Now by now, Paul, most of the guys have adjusted their cars. Once, twice, sometimes three times, some of them. And they should be having their handling down a bit pat. Now we'll see if they change the groove where they run the track just a little bit or not. That will tell us how slippery the racetrack is. Get an idea here how the changes to Michael's car have affected his handling that should improve. Last year, Al Unser Jr., you see him on the left of your screen in the blue and white car. Seriously considered Formula One as Michael Andretti has. But he reached a course point late last July when car owner Rick Gallus pressured him to sign a three-year contract. He did sign that contract, went out and won that race that day, and began a string of four victories, which carried him to the IndyCar Championship. Bobby Rahal closes up behind his teammate and begins a battle for third place. That'd be the time to see on their pin adjustment. Both of them changed the cars when they came in. Let's see how they end up on the track this time. The last time, uh, you'd have to say they were about even, Paul. Michael pulls away just a little bit. He's able Al. to put a second and a half lead over the second place car of Emerson Fittipaldi. Little Al in his ninth Indy. You get the feeling he's past due. I remember his first race back in the early 1980s. He was so excited he'd often take his car out to practice and not even bother fastening the seatbelt. The most laps that Michael Andretti has led in any one Indy 500 was 45 back in 1986. Today, he has already led 55 laps in this race. 91 laps are complete. The Andretti jinx is really part of the speedway. Will it strike here today? Both Andretti's running well, as are both Team Gallus cars, who you see here on the screen. So two teams of the three really heavyweight teams, Pesky's being the third, are contesting the lead right now. This is the fight at the moment. We're keeping track of the leader, but the battle is between these two cars. As I watch Bobby Ray Hall, Paul, I can just see that he's really working little Al over in the way that he's trying to figure out what he's doing or where he has a weakness. Like going in there now to keep him right in his front wing. To Gary Bentenhausen slows down, Bobby. Gary Bentenhausen, the story at the start, one of the Buicks, the fastest man in the field. Let's listen to that engine, if it's there at all. Well, that's sad, Paul. I, I think we've all kind of root for the underdog a lot of ways. And, of course, that's another Buick engine going out of the race. And we don't know that it's a Buick engine fault right now, but we don't see any other problems with the car. We just assume that that may be it. Gary Bettenhausen was running in 11th place, two laps behind the lead of the race. His crew waits for him. That's how they mark, so he knows exactly where to pull in. Usually he's in here much faster than he is now. The Bettenhausen dream, it looks as if we'll have to go another year unfulfilled. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Paul, the first thing they do now is they clean the radiator intakes in the front. They're unsnapping the, the bodywork, and that's the ominous sign. They're going to have to go down underneath, so it's going to be a long stop. Bettenhausen has raised the visor. That's all he can do. Just wait and see if the crew can identify the problem. As soon as we have word, we'll let you know. You can tell it's a little bit more serious than just maybe a possible electrical problem because nobody's hurrying as much as they normally would. That's kind of a telltale right there. The tough Bentonhausen luck. His brother, by the way, Tony, is in 18th place, so he at the moment at least is not a factor. The fight continues between little Al and Bobby Rahal for third. I started to say a little while ago, Rahal's worked little Al over pretty hard. Every time little Al looks at his mirror, Look at there, clear down the yellow line coming off the number four turn. That's to keep the front wing so the front 
front end doesn't push or he doesn't lose the grip on the front tire. Still, Ray that Hall. line surprised me. Ray Hall's wife, uh, uh, Dad, Michael, talked to me about uh, their Lebanese heritage. We're afraid of failing, he told me, more than anything else. And hey, last year, Bobby Ray Hall, see on the right of the screen, failed to win a single race for the first time in eight IndyCar seasons. But he's really set himself for goal this year. There's John Andretti. He runs in seventh place, and right now he finds himself between the leader of the race, Michael Andretti, and the second place car of Emerson Fittipaldi. But he's keeping pace with the leaders. Michael Andretti seems to be staying out in front. In other words, not losing ground. So, looks like the adjustments that he made really didn't hurt him that much in the pit stop, Paul. Back at the front of the field again, you can see Emerson Fittipaldi trying to close in on John Andretti. John not a factor in this fight, but Fittipaldi has moved the gap from almost the full two seconds behind the leader, Michael Andretti, where now he is just running just under a second behind. So Fittipaldi is on the road. Well, Fittipaldi is again. Should be a lot faster. He's been going all day. A pit adjustment or adjustment during the pit stop should help. But maybe, I just now noticed myself that Emma is gaining a little bit on Michael. So maybe Michael does have a little bit of a problem, contrary to what I just said. And can Emerson Fittipaldi take advantage of John Andretti? Here's Bettenhausen. He's climbing out of his car now. His day obviously done. Normally a driver would say stop. Strapped in that cockpit there was any chance of the car working at all. 14th time in 1955 that Gary Bentonhausen has failed to finish. The fastest car qualifying for this race. That's really kind of a sad deal, and especially for somebody that's been around as long as Gary Bentonhausen. To go through that spin that he did early, not hit anything to be able to continue, then mechanical problem. Driving for the John Menard team, Gary Bentonhausen flies out of the race. Our other car, of course, was Kevin Kogan. Now watching as little Al tries to hold off. It's hard to believe that only one year ago, little Al won his first oval race. The race that follows this is by a week, the race in Milwaukee. Just a year ago, he never won an oval up to that point. Little Al runs in fifth place. Rick Mears coming up to do battle with little Al. There's Rick there. at the front of the field it's still Michael 98 laps are complete so we're coming very close to the halfway point in this race Bobby Ray Hall he still runs in third chasing Emerson Fittipaldi with Michael Andretti out in front we'll be back for so many years in Indianapolis we followed the fate and fortune of the Bentonhausen family Gary Bentonhausen has just climbed out of the car it apparently seemed to be engine related Gary Yes, Gary, we had a problem with the chassis early in the race, and the car was very loose, and then we finally got the car working good, and I was running fifth gear trying to make up for lost time, and, uh, you know, I, just, I guess it just didn't like to be turned that hard, but I think it broke a valve or a rocker arm. And that was because of that first lap incident? Yes, well, I, uh, I don't know what happened. The car just turned loose on me. It hasn't done that all month long, and uh, early in the race, the car was just, really loose when I was when I was behind when I'd be behind somebody but we finally got the car where it was pretty decent for about the last 30 laps will there be a 20th year at Indianapolis for Gary Bettenhausen I'm sorry Gary I can't hear you will there be a 20th year for you at this same racetrack if John Menard and Glenn will have me I'll be back all right let's go back to the booth and Paul Page and we have now passed the 250th mile. We're actually at lap 104, averaging 169 and a half miles an hour. But should rain become a player now, the race would be officially called if in fact the track is drenched. There's no indication that that may be happening at this time. And into the pits, here comes Mario Andretti. Mario is running in fifth place as he rolls down to the Newman Haas team. Paul, as I watch Mario into the pits right now, I just noticed that Emerson Fittipaldi just turned the lap 220 miles an hour. The price of poker is going up, possibly some because of the weather. Mario pulls away in 16 and a half seconds. Good stop for the crew. And here is Hiro Mashusta, the Japanese in the race. Once, uh, once his position in the starting field became known, 
reporters flock to the speedway from Japan. His grandfather, of course, founded the Panasonic Company. Here is that name as a sponsor today, but he insists, as he falters away, that he doesn't have a great deal of backing from his family. He says that's a different tradition in Japan than it is in America. He must make his own way. You can certainly imagine the Japanese may be coming to Indianapolis in force to manufacturing capacity, and he would lead that wave. Here are the cars out of the race in this Valvoline race summary. Buddy Lazier, Willie Ribb, Betty Cheever, Roberto Guerrero with his accident, Kevin Cogan in the hospital now. We'll try to get a further update. A.J. Boyd, not injured in that accident. Scott Goodyear, Jim Crawford. Mike Groff, the fastest rookie in the field, out with a radiator problem. You saw Terrell Pomeroy's engine fire, and, and you just saw Gary Bentonhausen retire from the race. Now, we've been talking a lot about the different engines here, and the strongest report that we're hearing from the track here, though still labeled only as high-grade rumor, is that within the next few days, perhaps even tomorrow night, that the Indianapolis Motor Speedway may announce a new engine formula, and that that formula will be non-turbocharged engines, a 3.5-liter formula, which would match some other engines in the world, Bobby Hunter. I think everybody's been looking forward to that happening. There's been a lot of rumor of it for a long time, Paul, and I think uh, what it amounts to is that they're just, they just don't want to see one, one company like Chevrolet have such a big control over competitive racing and the IndyCar racing. Michael Andretti's crew is ready for the leader of the race on lap 108 to dart into the pit, refresh the fuel tank, and pick up some tires. Of course, who would then have the advantage in the Indy cars? Well, that engine is very much like the Formula One, and it's known that Roger Penske is working on his Formula One engine now. As Michael comes to the pits, here's Gary Darrell. Drew anxiously waves, now goes to a bent knee, and they wait the nose of the car. Remember, they made a wing adjustment the last time, but it was a puncture in a rear tire that caused the car to go loose. Michael now wants them to make the adjustment back to the original setup. They've reported no problems with fuel mileage that was early concerned, but the yellow flag certainly helped that situation. Ready to come off the jack, and boy, does he light it up once again. As usual, he is strong out of the pits. Michael Andretti what may be his last year for some time at the Indianapolis 500 if he takes his Formula One ride. The very quick stop in and out on the 108th lap. Good work by that Newman Haas crew. And the new leader of the race, of course, becomes Emerson Fittipaldi as they were running so very close to him. In second place now is Bobby Ray Hall, then Rick Mears, then Allen Sir Jr. Emerson's wife, Teresa, is pregnant with a boy due in late June. Fittipaldi was the first man to earn a million dollars for winning the 500. He did that two years ago. Ari Lansdijk duplicated the feat last year. How much money will they hand the eventual winner of this race? Fifth time in eight races that Fittipaldi has led the Indy 500, the two-time world driving champion. You, you keep saying time when you talk about uh, Emerson. And uh, it's funny, there's such a thing as Emerson time, because he's become so involved with whatever is happening at the moment, he's often late to whatever is next. He's too much of a gentleman to rudely whomever uh, he has been with, but hence the idea of Emerson time. He is, however, never late to races, and sometimes not even late to winter circle. The Penske crew waits for Emerson Fittipaldi. We mentioned bringing the car down under the line in the corners. Well, Mario Andretti, the officials say, has been doing it too much and using it to pass, and they have penalized Mario one lap as Fittipaldi heads for the pitch. pit stop and they ask him do you want any changes in the car he said no car okay car okay is all he said on the radio very pleased with the way the car is handling they've had no tire problems he's off the jacks and away in and out in just over 16 seconds the stop will take a little longer the further you go into the race because there is less fuel in the pit side tank and it takes a little longer to run out mario andretti was charged with one lap for driving below the yellow line between three and four Paul, well, that's the first time that I've seen that happen here. And I'm not saying it's not justified. That's for certain it is. They've been warned enough times.
Bobby Rahal comes in pits now. Rahal picked up the lead of the race, and so now here is Rahal in as the stop begin to cycle through, and Jack Arut is there. And Rahal finds his runs very nicely, comes to a complete stop. Now, they are not going to make any changes to Bobby Rahal's handling package. I asked Barry Green, the crew chief, what they were going to do. They said four new tires, and then we'll be back after it. They've dropped the air, and his teammate, Al Jr., has come in. Now, they're going to put brand new tires on Al Jr.'s car. Rahal's team went for scuffs. Now, Al Jr. taking on the full load of fuel. But here's the problem. They asked him what kind of changes he wanted on the car. He said, how about a little bit more boost? <laughs> Once more horsepower. Al Unser Jr. is out. Rick Mears was in and stop as well. And Emerson Fittipaldi, Rick's teammate, is out in front of the field, averaging now up to 172.1 miles an hour with 113 laps complete. ABC Sports coverage of the 75th Indianapolis 500 will return after this message and a word from our ABC station. Back in Indianapolis, 118 laps complete by the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi. He's turning laps up in the 213 mile an hour range. The average speed of the race, 172.7 miles an hour. Now there's the leaderboard. Michael Andretti is chasing him. Michael's about five seconds left, about five seconds back behind Fittipaldi. Then Ray Hall, Rick Mears, and Alan Hunter Jr. Now they have shown a black flag to Mario Andretti because apparently he's continued to pass under the line and they're afraid that he doesn't understand what they're going to penalize him for. Let's take a look, too, at the race summary as we're at this point in the race. The leader, of course, is Fittipaldi. There's Michael, though, who has led much of this race. And this is the summary of 100 laps. The average speed then, 168.1. And at that point, we had four caution lights. Now, let's kind of review that. Back at the beginning of the race, it was Gary Bettenhausen that spun in the very first corner. He spun and recovered, went on. But Buddy Lazier wasn't so lucky. He tapped the wall with his nose of his car, but it was nearly, nearly enough to be able to continue in the race, so he retired. And then we went to caution for Eddie Cheever. We had an accident involving Roberto Guerrero and Kevin Kogan. But the debris from the accident caught A.J. Foyt and took A.J. Foyt out of the race. Guerrero's okay, and Kevin Kogan was taken to the hospital, but he's believed to be in satisfactory condition. Gary Gerald now has an update on the Mario Andretti situation. Paul, well, we saw him come in on the pit stop. We were in the commercial break. He was violently shaking his head. Tony Sicali and the crew over the wall are on the radio to him. They were black flag. We are told to bring him in because of that penalty, as you mentioned, passing down under the yellow line. We only learned from one radio comment. Mario simply said, I cannot believe that. But the manner in which he was shaking his head, as much emotion as we've seen from Mario on the cockpit on a race car in years. Well, Paul, I find it very hard to understand how, if what we hear is true, that Mario got penalized in the lap for running under or running too low on the track right there, if we see that car going. And all the other cars, in other words, every car we've seen on the track is running under the, under the white or the close to the yellow line. It's the equal for all, I would think. The actual word was, though, passing under that line. Maybe that's where the distinction lies, Bobby. Paul, they're all doing that. We watched, uh, we've watched many passes where the guy goes under the white line like that right there. That giveaway is right there. And then as he goes across the short shoot, we watch the passing going on. I think it's a difference on how officials are reading it, or maybe they're not seeing it all. Roger Penske watches as his card with Emerson Fittipaldi. Fairly quick laps from the lead above 215 miles an hour. Now that's Fittipaldi, just came out of the screen. Look back in the field for Michael Andretti, and there's Michael. But Michael comes across the line about eight seconds behind the leader of the race. So for the moment, the battle is not joined at the front. The main thing, of course, is for Mario to try to contain his anger. He's got to be very angry about what has happened, but he cannot let that affect his driving. It's too dangerous. So at the front of the field, it is Emerson Fittipaldi, averaging 173.8 miles an hour to this point as we take you down through the top 10. 120 laps complete. You ride with Michael Andretti. He's in second place. The leader of the race is Emerson Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi has been running just above 215 and a half miles an hour. The average speed of the race is down at 174.9. That owing to three caution periods thus far and the 75th running of the Indianapolis 500. And they're showing Michael that he's nine seconds 
behind Emerson Fittipaldi. There's Trace with Fittipaldi. Do any day now. But she's still here supporting Emerson as best she can. Well, for the moment, she's taking a rest on the back of the pit wall. There's Fittipaldi. Yes. Look at that. Remember back in 1989 when these two battled with one another? Right up to the closing laps of the race, and then they touched, and Fittipaldi went over a million dollars. And little Al climbed out of a wrecked race car and saluted Fittipaldi as he came past on that final lap. Did that happen here today? So Fittipaldi out in front, started 15th, and is in the top position now. And you look back for Michael Andretti, who runs in second place, and there he is. Michael's a full nine seconds back. Third place is Bobby Rahal. He's 19 seconds behind the leader. And then Rick Mears runs in fourth place right now. The race here beyond the midpoint of the 128th lap has settled down just a bit. Everyone seems content to study, to watch, and to realize the cars have to make it to the 200th lap, the 500th mile. Now, next Sunday at 1 o'clock Eastern, it's the World League top teams as they battle out for the chance in the season's grand finale. London, who is undefeated in a titanic battle of the oceans, will take on New York. And then right after that, well, we'll be back with you as Hart's best return to hit the track for another test of speed in the Miller Genuine Draft 200. That's all next Sunday on ABC Sports. Now let's uh, get you up to speed on Kevin Kogan. Remember, he was involved in that accident with Roberto Guerrero. It took some time to get him out of the car as Michael Andretti is alongside of his cousin, not a battle for position. They took him to Methodist Hospital of Indianapolis, and now here is the report. He has a fracture of his right arm. Ray Hall, Ray Hall with smoke at the back of the car. And he pulls her down. Careful to watch behind that car, but that certainly looks, and it's coming out of the exhaust on both sides, looks like Ray Hall's done. As we wait for Ray Hall, let me continue with the condition of Kevin Kogan. He has a fractured right arm, a fractured right forearm, and a fractured right thigh. Dr. Terry Trammell will operate on him this afternoon. Let's go to Jack Aru. Well, probably the most simple way to describe the, the reaction by the crew here was when they took their hands and made the signal like they had broken something. The engine has expired on Bobby Ray Hall's car. They're just waiting for him to come down to pit road to confirm that. But let me update you on his teammate. His teammate, Al Jr., is also having a problem. They've got wastegate problems, and they are losing valuable horsepower from the turbocharger. Ray Hall, the engine's silent now rolls down through the pit area, and he will come to the Craco Gallus operation right there while they take a look at it to decide if there's anything they can do about it, but I don't think Ray Hall is too convinced they can. No, there's nothing can be done, Paul. The engine broke. Uh, you know, when they break, turning 12,000 and a half RPM, hey, it just blows everything up, and that's it. Bobby Ray Hall climbs out. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the Formula One and the Indy cars. A lot of the Formula One drivers are in the United States now, in fact, are here at Indianapolis in the VIP suite keeping track of this race. Remember how prominent they were in the 60s and 70s. Perhaps we'll see that return. Debbie Rahal gives Bobby a hug as he climbs out of the Indianapolis 500. So Ray Hall, the 1986 winner, becomes a spectator here today while Emerson Fittipaldi continues to lead at 176 miles an hour, the average speed to this point. Mike Landretti is 10 seconds behind. Back at Indianapolis, the 92 car is two-time winner Gordon Johncock, who started in last place. He now runs in 15th place, so he's more than half the way up on the field. And there's a quick stop for Michael Andretti being run under the green flag. Michael runs in second place. That would seemingly predict with a 16 and a half second stop that Emerson Fittipaldi is doing any time. You ride with Rick Mears. Mears runs in third place. So we run them down quickly for you. Fittipaldi and Michael Andretti before the stop. Rick Mears, Al Unser Jr. And a lap behind Ari Lyon Dyke, Scott Brayton, John Andretti, Mario Andretti. Danny Sullivan is now in ninth place with Alpha Power. Scott Pruitt. And then the 86 car of Jeff Andretti. Then Bernard Jourdain. Then Stan Fox. Gordon Johncock. Tony Bettenhausen. And Hiro Mashusta. Dominic Dobson. Randy Lewis. Pancho Carter. And Jeff Brabham. 
That's the lineup at the moment, and here comes the leader, Emerson Fittipaldi. Here's Jerry Punch. Again, a scheduled pit stop for Emerson Fittipaldi. Rick Rodham and the crew have just asked him again, do you want anything changed on the car? He said, no, it is perfect, perfect. Obviously, the, the laps he's turning over 218 miles an hour. Now trouble with the left front. Have a problem with the left front wrench. The car off the jet has cost him about four extra seconds, but he is down and away. Still pretty quick at 19 and a half seconds for Emerson Fittipaldi. Not knowing what might have gone wrong up front, did you notice just as he came out of pit lane, he gave it a little wiggle right to left, just making sure for himself that that left front wheel is on. And now Rick Mears. Throttles are down below the line, but that's been the line that Rick has been using. And let's see if he decides, not nope, he's going to stay out there. Rick Mears continues running on the circuit. 138 laps are complete. Remember, following his 1984 crash, Rick Mears was in the hospital for three months in his wheelchair for six after that. And as uh, the writer Rich Taylor once observed, he's someone who knows what racing can cause and yet can still keep the throttle down. These cars are all scored electronically as we wait for Rick Mears. They have little transponders and antennas that receive the signals of those transponders all around the racetrack. We'd hope as that would grow more and more that we'd be able to give you more information, but a primary computer and USAC system having failed, they're running on the backup system as Rick Mears turns down for the pits. That means that things like the uh, whole rundown of the 33 and some fascinating other information we had is not going to be available to you, including the time on pit road. Here's Rick Mears to stop. Fittipaldi picks the lead back up as Rick Mears patiently waits. Roger Pesci on the radio to Rick throughout the entire stop. In fact, Roger and Rick talk rather constantly. On board the defending champion at 146 live laps. Ari Leyendijk, though, is two laps behind the lead of the race right now, trying desperately to catch up as many of the teams have cycled through their pit stops. Really only see one more stop in this race if all goes according to their plans. Ari did make up one lap though. He was three laps back, so he is a fast moving car on the track. At the front of the field, it's Emerson Fittipaldi being chased by Michael Andretti. Michael is just five seconds back. And Rick Mears, you see Michael come off the corner. That's the number five car just crossed the line. That's Fittipaldi. And there, still five seconds back. Now four seconds. Now four seconds back is Michael. They're both running 212.7 miles an hour. Danny Sullivan, 1985 winner in the pits. Remember his teammate Roberto Guerrero fell out. We've got another car in trouble. Scott and Brayton. this is Scott Brayton with an engine. Looks like it's in trouble, Bobby. Yeah, it's a lot of smoke coming out of there. What's well, a bad look. Going to bring out a yellow. He parked right yeah. on the racetrack. Now he wants out of the car. He's feeling some heat from under there. So. He hasn't water. disconnected his uh, communications either. He ripped them apart. The engine blew bad, the hot water, that's a lot of steam, not just smoking the engine, but it's a lot of steam that's coming yeah. out. So he's been sprayed with some very hot water and he's feeling the effects. That's nothing to laugh about, that's got to hurt Scotty terribly. So the yellow flag comes out in Indianapolis, 148 laps. That means this yellow may in fact help some of the teams that have not stopped. It'll certainly help Danny Sullivan who is still in his car, but they're working on the back of his Alfa Romeo. At the front of the field is still Emerson Fittipaldi. Sports coverage of the Indy 500 will return after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Mexico's Bernard Jourdain is under tow, while Scott Pruitt's disabled car is on the hook. And we are under yellow at the Indianapolis 500 with Emerson Fittipaldi. There's Scott Pruitt's car leading, Michael Andretti, but we run under the yellow, and this is bringing the average speed down. Now, this was Fittipaldi's problem in the pits earlier. Look at the left front of the car there as they struggle to get that air wrench off. And that burned up some valuable seconds. Now, at first blush, you would think that it doesn't matter too much how much time you spend one second here or there. But let me tell you, it makes a world of difference. We have a little animation for you, Sam Posey. 
That is because, now let's set up this situation. You see two cars essentially traveling at the same speed around the track, but one of them chooses to come into the pits. Now watch what happens as he slows. Now this would be hypothetically under green and stops at the pits. Notice how far around the car that continues at full speed is getting. Now remember, the car coming out of the pits does not instantly resume full speed. And in fact, it takes at least a lap for him to get up full speed. Bobby Unser's described it brilliantly as the flywheel effect, and it takes a while to get that flywheel to go. Now the point of all this is to understand, as you can see right there, how nearly the man that goes into the pits is lapped because he makes that pit stop. If he has a long pit stop, a 21 second stop, instead of a 15 second stop, he does get laps. It's very critical. Let's go down to Jack Aroot with a further update on Fittipaldi. Well, this is Rick Reinemann who calls a lot of the shots for Emerson Fittipaldi. And Rick, you got a report that a clutch is going on the car. Yeah, Emerson told us the clutch was slipping when uh, he left the last time and now it, uh, he has no clutch now. So our next stop, we're gonna end up having to push him out. What about, is it slipping it all out on the racetrack right it now? It doesn't seem to be. Our speeds are still up, so um, we're going to play this one by ear. Now, they're only allowed 17 men in the pit box. They're only allowed so many over the wall. What they're going to have to do is try and ensure that he can get that thing going as quickly as possible. You'll have people on the back wing pushing. We'll have to have them pushing very carefully, though, so that they don't uh, tear the wing off. We've got to get them out of here. Paul? Well, that's happened before. The crew getting a little overzealous and actually capable of pushing the wing off the car, and that wouldn't help here, Bobby. Now, what they're going to do, Paul, is when he comes into the pit, he's going to have the car Scott neutral. Scott back in his pits, Bobby. Try to let it idle as slow as he can. They'll push him as fast as they can get him going, then he'll chunk it into first gear, and the gears are not like we know in normal transmissions. They're two dogs that have to go together. So if he can keep the engine running, it'll work. From high above the speedway, the Blimp America from the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, Captain Aaron Jenkins of Spring, Texas, giving us some of the overhead view. You saw Scott Brayton out of the car just a moment ago. There's the America. And you can see the skies behind her are much lighter than they were earlier. The leader of uh, the race is Fittipaldi. Here's the defending champion, Ari Leyendijk, in for a stop. And they are working at the back of that car underneath the rear wing as well. Bobby, what do you think they're doing? They're putting, they're taking the wing out of the front end of the car, putting wing into the back. You can see that speed wrench, that adjusts the angle of the rear wing. All of the lower cars have that. So it's a big chassis adjustment. Now he's pointing to the left front, trying to tell him something. Right there now, the wing wasn't adjusting properly, so they had to loosen up those screws. So adjust the angle of it and tighten it back down. And Ari hurries back into the fight. Ari has been moving up steadily. He runs in fourth place right now. Ironically, Paul, he's been very fast all day. It's that broken spark plug early in the race that cost Ari a lot. Otherwise, he'd be up with the leaders. So the Dodge Viper pace car begins to accelerate, and we should see a fight for the lead when they come back between Fittipaldi and Michael Andretti. Also, Paul, I was doing a little bit of calculation, and I think we're going to have one more pit stop for sure. But it looks like they're going to have to go to about one lap 162. Maybe they're going to, or excuse me, one lap 167. But now because the yellow is probably the 170, so they'll be able to make it the rest of the lead. As they come back to green, Rick Maris comes way over to the inside, but Michael Andretti comes up to challenge the leader of the race, Emerson Fittipaldi. Mike right at the front of the field, and Michael takes him. Michael takes him going into one. Remember that before the yellow, Michael closed in dramatically on Emerson. Then the yellow came out, reshuffling things. Now he's showing that speed again. Now, one of the things that happened right there is, is remember, Emil has no clutch. Michael does. Michael's been adjusting his car. So has Emil, but Emil's got a problem. So you have to start that race and shift the gear. Emil is probably a little careful because he has no clutch to help him shift. Plus, Bobby, we know that Emerson is going to lose time on the remaining pit stop that you refer to that's coming up in about 10 laps. No doubt about it, Sam. It's going to hurt him for sure, and he knows that too. Vittipaldi chases Michael Andretti and falls about two seconds, now about eight tenths of a second behind as he comes across the line there. Rick Mears runs behind his teammate in third place. So Rick Mears, while he fell backwards in the early going of this 500-mile race, is very definitely a factor as well. The Penske car runs second and third with Fittipaldi in second. Michael Andretti back in the lead. He's been in this race throughout the day. 154 laps are now complete, so we're three-quarters of the way. 
would have seen the rain here this morning, you would have guessed that there was no chance of running the race, let alone get this far. Here's the Valvoline race summary at the end of 150 laps. Then it was Fittipaldi was the leader. That's changed now. He started back in 15th. The average speed was 177.3 miles an hour with 11 lead changes and five caution periods. Sandy Andretti watches her husband in the lead. 155 laps are actually complete. Now with Emma running in second place right now, I think the main problem that he's going to have is not so much because of a pit stop coming up that he'll have trouble with. It's not gonna be Michael Andretti right here. It's gonna be the guy behind him who's Rick Mears. That's the guy that's gonna work on Emma Hart. Let's get an update on Michael now from Gary Jarrett. Well, it was interesting watching the Newman Haas crew just before that last yellow. In four laps, Michael was getting just over a second lap chasing Fittipaldi. So the crew was confident that he'd have a chance to jump Emma on the restart. That's the way it turned out. He liked the setup. Remember, they made that wing change, and they also went to a little bigger stagger, they were saying, on the last set of tires. Said he liked it a lot, and obviously, it's now paying off in performance. Well, Michael's been picking the pace up 219 miles an hour in the last lap. But Fittipaldi and Mears are staying right there. They certainly are, Paul. If we'll always remember, historically, the fastest pace in the race will be in the latter part of the race. The guys will get their cars adjusted the best for the conditions they're running in under plus. The track is nice and clean. Fittipaldi trimmed another four tenths of a second off as Jeff Andretti has his engine problems and pulls to the side. He's the highest running rookie at this point. He's had a great month and is a sure candidate for Rookie of the Year honors when the uh, media votes on those. Rather subjective vote that they have, not based on position at all. That's the old reliable yeah, yeah. Cosworth engine, too, Paul. I might mention that that Jeff Andretti has in his car. And Jeff was able to get the car down into the pit area, so that enables the race course to stay under green conditions. Jeff Andretti has been the most consistent finisher among the Andretti this year. But what? Look at Michael. But look at Fittipaldi. Fittipaldi is now, well, that separation is a tenth of a second. And Rick Mears is right behind Fittipaldi. First, second, and third. All two, years, two years ago, Emerson Fittipaldi battled with the other great second generation driver, Al Unser Jr. Al is having problems, but now he's taken up the battle with the other great second generation driver, Michael Andretti. Danny Sullivan, who you last saw in the pits, is back out in action, running ninth right now. And by the way, the rumors about Alfa Romeo relieving, now they say they'll stay in Indy. We're back, we're staying at the front of the field because that's where the race has been all day. Michael Andretti leaves it, but there are two stories now beginning to develop. Indications are that just any time now, Michael Andretti will come into the pit, perhaps within the next two laps. There's the third place car, Rick Mears. We're on lap 163. Bobby Andres tends to feel that you should get to at least 167 to make it to the end of the race. On the other hand, the second place car is Emerson Fittipaldi. And Fittipaldi has a troublesome clutch that will make it very difficult for him to roll out of the pit. So we may have here brewing what we saw in 1982, and that is one incredibly close finish with Michael, Emma, and Rick Mears all involved. They're all on the same straightaway together now, and they've just pulled Michael hit in one lap. But let me tell you, sometimes they use the board to say one thing and the two-way radio to say another thing. It's all part of the intelligence game that is played between the crews here at Indianapolis. I don't really think so, Paul. I think that Michael's going to have to come in, and, and uh, I really think he's going to be close to his last stop. It's going to make a story for the end of our race. It's a fantasy. The 75th running of the Indianapolis 500. Ray Haroon won the first year 80 years ago. Last time an Andretti led a race, an Indianapolis race, this late in the game was in 1987 when Mario led almost the whole way, got to lap 180, and then broke down. We are at lap 166 now. You see Michael Andretti. Michael, the number 10 on the back stretch. He's been told to bring the car to the pits on the next lap. That will give the lead to Emerson Fittipaldi and bring the mirrors up to second place. But of course, Fittipaldi and Mears will all have to stop. They are the only ones that run on the lead lap right now. They run together on the straightaway. Michael Andretti peels off and heads down to the pits, and Gary Gerald waits for him. 
indeed we do, Paul, and as you've indicated, we don't think he can go the distance without making another stop. I don't know that they're gambling on a yellow. We do know that his father, Mario, was having a fuel problem. We were not aware of a fuel problem for Michael, but right now they change the rubber. They pour in the precious fuel. He'll have 33 laps plus to go to get there. And of course, the guy in the catbird seat would seem to be Mears because of the clutch problem for Fittipaldi. He's down and he's away, and it wasn't particularly fast. Now, 19 seconds. Now, 19 and a half seconds, Terry Carroll. Okay, one of the things they'll do, Paul, is they make double sure that they had that thing as full of fuel as they could possibly get. There's Emma coming right there across the start finish line, the red and white car. That makes but, him the new leader of the race. Yes, he is. And then, What's going to happen with Michael? He has two options that he can do. One of them is he can shift the engine to a higher gear, providing Emil has the problem getting out of pits that we think he's going to have. The next option is he can turn the boost back a little bit, and these are all options provided he doesn't wait too long to do it. Now, if they bring him in at that point, that should put Emerson Fittipaldi within striking distance of the 200th lap or 500th mile. And don't forget, Coming up next on ABC Sports, Scott Pruitt, Rusty Wallace, Bill Elliott, they're in the lead as we head into the second round of the International Race of Champions. That's next, right here on ABC. We wait for Fittipaldi. He has a clutch problem. They've asked him to come in on the 169th lap by radio. That's one lap away. But the stop should see him struggle to get out of the pits. And if it goes wrong, Bobby, he could damage that clutch and it could all be over. Well, he won't have a clutch, Paul. What's happened to the clutch? You can tell that the clutch itself is not bad. It's the hydraulic part of it that actuates the clutch that's bad. So he really doesn't have a clutch problem, as most people would think. It's just the clutch working. So what he's going to have to do is just be able to get it into the first gear, leaving the pits, which we'll see in just a minute now. So Emerson Fittipaldi rolls down the pit lane and rolls toward Jack Aroot for what may be his final stop. And Paul, this is when the butterflies become big, not only in the driver, but also on every crew member. They bring the car to a stop. He's complaining of severe understeer, so they are going to change all four tires. He's trying to keep the engine rev. They are going to take every ounce of fuel left here because they have figured it down to having a two-lap margin to finish the race with the fuel available. They've completed the work on the tires. They're waiting to take on all the fuel. They drop down, and you can hear them having the difficulty getting out. Bobby uh, described, and now so slowly he motors out. Bobby, you had it figured perfectly. Here's the leader of the race, Rick Mears, as Fittipaldi rolls away. Now remember, Paul, this is the guy that better start worrying about a little bit. As Rick Mears comes to a stop, Jack Arruda is there. Teammate to Emerson Fittipaldi, he knows now that Fittipaldi had a problem. They had a problem now with the air jacks getting the car up. To no concern, though, they'd already taken the tires off. Jerry Brian is the first one completed. Richard Buck and the rest of them are done. They're going to take on all the fuel on this side, too. Taking a long time to bring it in. Mears is off and away. And Michael Andretti wins that fight as Rick Mears comes away. And Michael comes back to the front. Andy Andretti knows that Michael is now within striking distance of the Indianapolis 500 victory flag. But what they also know is that he stopped the last time right on the edge of the envelope. Yeah. Don't say beyond it. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly watches his driver, Ari Leyendijk, the defending champion. He runs in fourth place. Now keep in mind, Paul, if Emmo and if Rick Mears keep pushing Michael as hard, look at Fittipaldi, still not running at speed. Fittipaldi still terribly slow. Roger Penske is on the radio to Rick. Chuck Sprague stays on the radio to Emerson Fittipaldi. Jack Aroot. Paul, the problem is trying to get out of the pits. He stripped the gears. He's got literally the gearbox in shreds, and they are very disgusted here. Very disgusted. The crew is just totally devastated by this. They knew and they were worried. And it seems to have come true. Fittipaldi will not win the Indianapolis 500. Well, that salute, I think, indicates that Fittipaldi is rolling back to the pits and will roll out of the race. The leader as he came in for his stop. It was a difficult maneuver. Here's Mario in the pits now. This race traditionally changes in the last 10 laps. We're approaching that area now. The green flag is back out. And Rick Mears comes around John Andretti. He's no 
factor whatsoever, but Michael is right there with him. Michael, moving to the outside. Can he keep in the high room? He did it in Phoenix. Can he do it here? Michael oh. Andretti takes the lead away from the oh. That's one of the toughest passes I've ever seen. A short shoot pass with two cars running nearly the same speed. I'll just bet you that Rick Mears thought that would have been impossible, and I just can tell you, he never, ever looked for Michael to go that way. That is sheer virtuosity by Michael Andretti, Bobby. You don't, don't you agree? That was That was one of the finest pieces of driving, one of the hardest pieces of driving I've seen. And Sam, it's very difficult to pass somebody on the outside like that, and especially a car that's just as bad. And from Bobby Andre's point of view, a position on the track that he was not expecting. But here is Rick Mears now in the same position as Mears, who has been driving a very clear line this way, takes Michael Andretti. 187 laps into the record book. The fight is at the front. Four hats off to him now. If you ever see racing better than that, I'd certainly like to know where it's going to be. That's Rick's wife, Chris Mears, as Rick is back out in front. What I was going to remind you of, in the last 10 laps, the lead tends to change here in 89. Fittipaldi taking the race away from Al Unser. In 86, Bobby Rahal taking it away from Kevin Kogan. The two wives pray their husbands around. In 83, Tom Sneva took the race away from Al Unser. Bobby Unser won here in 1975, taking the race away from Al Unser. the last place to be called the train from Johnny Rutherford. Rick Mears has driven for Roger Penske at the Speedway for the first year, winning three of those races, an incredible record. He's literally pulling away from Michael right now. There's something that's gone wrong with Michael because I don't know what it is, but he's definitely falling back a little bit. Rick is just sailing away. I wouldn't think that Rick's car would be that much better just all of a sudden. Well, Rick Mears joined the list of four-time winners at the Indianapolis 500. Al Unser, A.J. Boyd are the only other two. This, this year, the first year that Rick Mears has ever hit the wall on this track. Also, the first year he ever left the during the month of May. Earlier this week, he went down to his new home in Florida to supervise the construction. He came back. That's a different kind of Rick Mears. Rick Mears at 39, starting to look toward the end of his career. What a way to start the end of his career. The front of the race belongs to Rick Mears. You saw his wife, Chris, on the radio. Not to Rick, but passing information to the board man. And here's your third place driver right now, the defending champion, Ari Leondike. He is a lap behind the race. But if Ari, something should happen at the front of the field, he's right there. And Ari has never given up, and that's a great point because with the two leaders dueling it out, he might be in a very good position. Shows that he is a true champion, Sam, because he's revving hard all day even though he got behind. But the thing is, as you watch Mears and Michael, two fine drivers today. At the front of the field is Rick Mears, but the yellow flag comes out. There is a car sitting on the entrance to the pit lane. And apparently they decided to bring the yellow out, and it's none other than Mario Andretti. What an irony. The yellow flag would prevent his son from having any chance to counterattack against Rick Mears. Ah, but then it might give him a chance because it will put Michael Good right point. up next to Good Rick. point, good point for a restart. And what happened on the last restart? Michael was able to rip by Rick. So the face of this race changes again as the yellow is out, and it will be a definite sprint to the finish with nine laps to go. At the 75th running of the Indy 500, 193 laps complete. Let's go back and take a look. This was the last restart at 185 laps into the race. And look at how the two of them battled coming back into the corner, and Michael Andretti went around on the outside but seeing it could be done just a lap later, Rick Mears did exactly the same thing. And as a result of that, well, here we get a, a look at that once again. Spectacular little piece of driving. As John Andretti wisely got out of the way, and Michael just swept by to the outside. We should be going back to green. Lights are out on the pace car, indicating we should come back to green flag. Rick Mears has won three Indy 500s but he's lost two of the closest in history to John Cock by 16 one hundredths of a second in 82, and by two seconds to Ray Hall in 86. The point is he is no stranger to close finishes. Michael Andretti has never been involved with a battle for the lead in the Indy 500 when it counted. It counts now. Six laps to go. Rick 
really got to run out at that time at the restart, uh, Paul. He wasn't going to let Michael sneak up on him. He didn't have any traffic to worry about, nor did Michael. Look at that. There are so few cars left in the race. Rick has a completely clean racetrack ahead of him and will for probably three to four laps. I think what happened during that passing that they did back and forth is you'll find that they found a new groove on that racetrack. Rick speeds have picked up like over 220 miles an hour. We started with 33 cars. Only a third of the field is left. Heavy attrition here today in Indianapolis. Rick was the fastest qualifier, remember? He ran the four best laps when it counted on pole day. He was the pole sitter. Now he has a track ahead of him. He's just splashing in there. Rick Mears right now is doing what he does best. But Rick Mears once told me that in 1982, he made a mistake in the last corner of the last lap that gave the race to Gordon Johncock. Were it not for that split second, then Rick Mears might be driving for his fifth Indianapolis victory. Let's get an update report on Michael Andretti. And as the laps run out for Michael Paul, he reports on the radio, uh, understeer condition. That means push. That means you've got to bully that race car through the corner. That may cost him the opportunity to challenge Mears because Mears, as he flies by his us toward turn one, looks like he's got a great balance set up. And a grim look, you saw it from Sandy Andretti. As she watched Michael come by and is privy to the conversations that go on between the driver and his crew. Rick Mears, 196 laps complete. Now pushing Michael's car is just going to kill his speed. It bogs him down the corners, absorbs up horsepower, kills the straightaway speed, hurts him all the way around. But Rick Mears has got the really like it right now, though. There is no other contest through the field except for the lead. Everyone else is set out laps actually separating them. There's second place. You saw Rick come through. Penske team has won in 72, in 79, in 81. In 84, there's Carl Haas, owner of Michael Andretti's car. Chris Mears, who, of course, is communicating with her husband, Sandy Andretti. Those are the players waiting in the pit. Don't themselves at this point to do anything about it. 2.3 seconds separated. Rick Mears and Michael Andretti on the last pass to the start finish line. They're averaging 175.7 miles an hour. Not near the race record set here last year at 185.9 miles an hour by Ari Leyendijk. Ari Leyendijk is still in this race. He runs in third place, a lap behind the leader. But Ari does, in fact, have the leaders in sight. So should anything happen in these last two laps, Ari Leyendijk is definitely within striking distance and could pick up his second win. Rick Mears on the back stretch. crowd anticipates a potential four-time win for Rick. Michael Andretti in a desperate drive to try and catch him. On a day that sees what may be the retirement from competition by the great four-time winner, A.J. Foyt, we may see another four-time winner crowned in Rick Mears. And the white flag has been thrown to Rick Mears, indicating one lap to go. Now less than two miles for Rick Mears. If he holds on, he will become the third four-time winner of the Indianapolis 500 here on the 75th running of the great race. Chris Mears is Rick Rick for straightaway. One corner left to go. One corner left to run. You can see the checkered flag just ahead of him now. Turn to the 75th Indianapolis 500 after this word from our ABC station. 
And Rick Mears has come into victory lane. He's being hoisted on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway podium, getting the congratulations first of his wife, Chris, then of his crew chief, Richard Buck, Jerry Bria, and now Roger Penske has moved in to congratulate this man who now has four likenesses on the Borg Warner Trophy. Rick Mears follows in the footsteps first of the legendary A.J. Foyt, and then Al Unser Sr. Rick. Right. Rick, congratulations on right. being offered again by Chris. It is absolutely crazy up here today. Rick, congratulations on that restart. Not the last one, but the one before. Michael Andretti blew by you. And then it was like just another lap, and you said nothing doing. What was going through your mind? Well, that was, uh, that was, the last, that was that last lap I usually talk about at the last end of the race. That's when you do it when it's necessary. And we got down there, and... You know, we had a run at him from a little toe on the straightaway, and I said, oh, there's nothing to lose now. we got to go or not. And so I just went ahead and ran it up on top and went around the outside, and uh, we were thankful. The, the, the car was working just absolutely great, and it just, you know, everything, everything went our way. It, when it's your day, it's your day. What can I say? Marvel you have been so great. close in several of your victories that you were denied. The Gordon Johncock one comes to mind. You have said before that if you hadn't maybe made a mistake there, this could have been your fifth Indianapolis 500. Well, that's, you know, we found out uh, we went one lap too early on that race, and uh, and it caught us out short. Uh, we should have had it, but it wasn't our turn. So, I mean, I tell you, I'm tickled to death. I, I never I never dreamed of getting one here, let alone three, let alone four. So, I'm just tickled to death. I uh, tell you, the Marlboro guys, the team did a tremendous job. I mean, this is this is our backup car. Shows you how good our backup car is. And uh, they just did a hell of a job. The Goodyear tires worked great along. And obviously, the Chevy was strong when we got to run at Michael. So, we're just excited. I, I don't know what to say. Well, we're going to let you take the customary gulp of milk, and we're going to talk to Chris here for a second. Chris, unlike years past, you and Rick went back to Florida, back to your home here, and you decided to get away from the speedway. Is that, was that going through your mind, thinking, hey, we've got to get away from this madness after he crashed during practice and then came back to sit on the pole? Actually, Rick's the one that decided that. He, he just said, hey, i got to get away. This month's getting to me, and I said, fine, whatever you want to do. This is your month. Let's do it. Maybe that was our good luck charm, I don't know, but the crew did such a great job, and I'm so proud of him. You have run the gamut of emotions this year. You saw your husband crash in the day before pole position qualifying. You showed the concern on your face. Then you came back and watched him put it on the pole, and today you ran the roller coaster. I was down there and saw you when they first reported the car was loose. You've been up and down all month. This month has been the toughest month that I've known in racing. It really has. Um, you know, every year it just seems like it gets more and more competitive and more and more and more and more harder. And I'm just so happy. I really am. Paul, when you think about it, only three men in the 75-year history have won the Indianapolis 500 four times. First, as we said, A.J. Foyt, who says this is the end. Al Unser Jr., and now this man, Rick Mears. Yeah, but it took A.J. Foyt 20 years to start to get his fourth win. Took Al Unser 22, it only took Rick 14. Don't forget, there'll be more racing later with the International Race of Champions and more from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. There's the unofficial order right now. Gary Gerald alongside Michael Andretti, and it's hard to gauge the emotion. You come so close to the greatest possible victory in motorsports. What a showdown on the last 15 laps with Rick Mears. Well, we gave it everything we had, uh, but we just uh, came up a little short. The car was running really good, but uh, Rick just had probably about a mile per hour or two of, on us in straightaway speed and uh, just couldn't defend myself. Your dad brought out the yellow late in the race. You were able to close back up on Rick. What kind of thoughts flashing through your mind then? Keeping in mind also you got a break with a yellow flag earlier that got you the splash of fuel you needed. Yeah, well, I was hoping that uh, you know I'd be able to get a jump on Rick, but uh, he played the last last uh, start a little bit better than he did the one prior to that so uh, you know it, I couldn't get a run on him he just uh, again he just was very strong on a straightaway and uh, we just couldn't do anything but uh, you know the Kmart Howland guys a great job in the pits and the car ran great but not good enough will we see Michael Andretti in an IndyCar at this racetrack next May I wish I could answer that right now I can't maybe maybe not we hope we do thank you Michael thank you Paul his best finish ever here Michael Andretti Best before was fourth. He now finishes in second. And Rick Mears takes the win. We'll be back with more. Let's go back and look at the fight here in the 75th Indianapolis 500 as they came to the restart on the 187th lap. This is from Michael's point of view. That is Rick just ahead. And Rick started everywhere he could to get around John Andretti. 
But then Michael nailed the throttle, and look how high up he runs. All the way up. He's got to be careful of that wall to the right and then sweeps across Rick. Now, this is the way it looked as Michael came around from outside the track to the fans' point of view. Boy, he just swept across the front of Rick Mears and then pulled away. But one lap later, Rick Mears was already closing back in as fast as he could. Into turn three, Rick chasing Michael. Rick closing on Michael. And this was the moment in the 75th running that made the difference as they came onto the main stretch. You're running the 188th lap. Mears set Michael up. Took the lead and drove on to the win. And for Michael Andretti, he was in front, flashed across the line at the 188th lap. And then there was Rick. And the race was over. Third place, Ari Leyendijk. Now he is with Jerry Punch. A number of smiling faces here, Paul. Of course, Vince Granatelli and Bob Tezak, the car owners, and Ari Leyendijk. Ari, you had a great run today, but one miscue, one, one pit stop early on cost you. Yeah, we had to make an unscheduled pit stop to replace the spark plugs, and it put us a lap down. It was hard for the crew to get that done within time. So we basically fought that all day, but the car pretty much ran good, and I'm just really excited, you know, for my crew, for my new sponsors, uh, RCA, uh, the Mesa Corporation with CNG and Total Petroleum, and, uh, you know, if you can't win, it's, it's still a little bit of a disappointment, but I'm really happy with it anyway. You had the best seat in the house for that battle between Michael and Rick Mears. I mean, did you think that Michael may have had a shot at him? I was hoping Michael was going to get real aggressive there at the end, but he didn't. So, uh, you know, I still had a chance because of that. But uh, now I think Rick was pretty much in control. I think the guy who could run up in front today was the guy with an advantage because it was really tough running behind other cars with the windy conditions. The Flying Dutchman, last year's Indy 500 winner, the man who wanted Phoenix, finishes third here today. Paul? By the way, that finish moves him second behind Rick Mears in PPG points coming out of this race. ABC Sports coverage of the 75th Indianapolis 500, now won by Rick Mears, will return after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Race drivers hope that a helmet like this will fend off oil and grease and grime and provide them with the protection that they need to drive home to victory lane or a fifth place finish like John Andretti did. John, when you don't win but you have a good run, what does that make a driver feel like? Well, if you don't win, uh, you don't feel very good. Um, I know that this team, the Penzoil team, is, is more than capable of winning. They prepared a car that was um, very reliable and, and I was pleased. The handling went in and out. but. Um, you know, that's not the whole story, and, um, and I'm pretty disappointed at, at um, you know, some of the things that happened on the track. The reason like why, what? Well, the reason why we lost two laps, and, um, you know, I'm not sure. I, I understand completely why, um, why we got put in that predicament um, when the pace car, you know, pulled out. But um, I'm, I'm sure I don't understand it, and I'm sure, um, you know, somebody will explain it to me. But, you know, at this point, um, you know, we got taken out very early. Um, we got put that lap down, and I mean, we were we're out there running. We're not running too bad either. I mean, I could see him at the end of the straightaway, and all of a sudden we're lapped down. It's um, when you go a lap down that way versus if it was a mechanical problem. That's that's got to really make it for a long afternoon for some. Well, you know, you fight, um, you fight to keep it there, and then you fight like hell to try and get it back. And and I tried like hell to get around Michael, and uh, I just couldn't get around him. And I ran right behind him, and. And then when we got caught in traffic, uh, my car started jumping around a little bit, and, and uh, I could just couldn't hang on to it anymore. Well, there's another man that hopes to become the oldest driver to run in next year's Indianapolis 500. He finished this one, and he's with Gary Gerald. Jack, we're talking about Gordon Johncock. Nine years ago, he won this race for the second time. Gordy, at age 54, started 33. You end up sixth. Congratulations on just a terrific day. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, we're very pleased. Uh, you know, we really didn't run that quick all day, but we stayed in and stayed steady. We run between 195 and 200, had some great pit stops from the guys, you know, and just everything went our way today, and uh, we were able to stay in there. And you've been sick all this week. You had the flu, you spent some hospital time, and, and any ill effects at all in the race car? No. Uh -uh. I've been a lot sicker than this than Clem in a race car before, and 
once you get in the car and the green flag drops, uh, you don't think about being sick. What's the next race we're going to see you compete in? Well, I really don't know. Uh, I have no plans. Well, we hope we get a chance to see you do it again. Well, we hope to be back. Uh, I think I'm going to beat Foyt. I'm going to be the oldest driver to ever run here. <laughs> you heard it. Gordon Johncock sneaking up on Supertex. Paul? Feisty little Gordy. Well, the results are unofficial until 8.30 tomorrow, but Rick Mears looks to have won it. Rick Mears has scored his first win in over a year, but it's the biggest one in his career, the 75th Indianapolis 500. With some reflections, here's Jack Whitaker. Thank you, Paul. I think there was a certain beautiful symmetry here today in this Indy 500. The first four-time winner, A.J. Foyt, bowing out early with a curtain call, and the coming of the newest four-time winner in Rick Mears. Rick Mears and the Penske team wrote another glorious new page in Indy history, and it was quite another great Indy celebration, a relatively safe race and a dramatic and emotional day. The speeds here, although they weren't record today, is something you can't see on television. It's something almost all the five senses can appreciate. You see it, obviously. You hear it. It's an elegant wine you'll never forget. And you can literally almost touch it. And these drivers that climb into these tiny little cars are either the bravest men in the world since the fellows that ate the first oyster or the most fearless. There's talk now about a change in the formula here, and perhaps it will be a good thing to open up the competition. But they'll never change the fact that you're going to find fearless men like this to drive them. The race goes on here at Indy to find safer cars, and I expect most people hope some cheaper cars. Paul? And brave men to own them as well, Jack. This is Roger Penske's 65th career win, A.J. Foyt. Perhaps he's retired. We'll be back. When Rick Mears started this race, he had earned more than any other man at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, over $3 million. Maybe tomorrow night when they award the purse here, he'll take home another million to add to that. In the Valvoline race summary, of course, the winner is Rick Mears. He started from the pole. It's now the third time that he has won from the pole. The race speed, not nearly a record, 176.4 miles an hour, but a great race with 18 lead changes. You can also take a look at the unofficial results. They're official tomorrow morning. Mears, Michael Andretti, Ari Leondike, Cal Unser Jr., John Andretti. Gordon Johncock with a tremendous drive. Mario Andretti, Stan Fox, Gary Bettenhausen, Tony Bettenhausen, then moving to 11th, Emerson Fittipaldi, Scott Pruitt, Dominic Dobson, Randy Lewis, and Jeff Andretti. Hero Mashusta, Scott Brayton, Bernard Jourdain, Bobby Rahal, Jeff Brabham, Pancho Carter, Gary Bettenhausen, Finland's Terrell Palmroth, Rookie Mike Groff and John Paul Jr. Jim Crawford, Scott Goodyear, the great A.J. Foyt, Kevin Kogan, we wish him well, Roberto Guerrero, Eddie Cheever, Willie T. Ribs, and the first accident of the race, Buddy Lazier. Don't forget, we've got the International Race of Champions still coming up this afternoon on ABC Sports. The terrible disappointment of the Andrettis. Perhaps this year was their best chance. And for Rick Mears... Rick Raven Mears of Bakersfield, California, has scored his fourth Indianapolis 500-mile race win. So now the planning begins because the lineage continues on. For Sunday, May 24th, 1992, and the 76th running of the Indianapolis 500, we thank all our racing team who did such a superb job here today. I'm Paul Page. So long from Indianapolis.